The views expressed in the following show are of the host, the guest, and the callers, and not necessarily the views of Interstreams Radio, IPS Media Works, the Jancic Radio Network, nor its advertisers and affiliates. The content of the following show, its accuracy, authenticity, and the ramifications of the use or application of said content is the responsibility of those speaking and listening, not the broadcast medium. I want to welcome us, welcome, welcome us, double, double Dietrich. We're going to, this is starting out real good. Welcome us, double Dietrich, as the Douglas Dietrich, back to the show. We're doing a live, I guess we want to call it a taping, an interview uh, live uh, for later release, hopefully very soon, as in tonight, at least for the audio. And it will show up on YouTube for the video with annotations. And um, so I want to welcome back Douglas Dietrich. Welcome, Douglas. It's great to be here, uh, and uh, always glad to keep touch with your listenership, and uh, your listenership and mine are uh, definitely people who are concerned about the world around them, and uh, I just regret the fact that we couldn't have done this earlier. Uh, Mr. Yanchik and I were aiming for uh, 9 a.m. There were a number of technical difficulties that we had to contend with, and uh, also there were a number of biochemical difficulties on my part, because I don't so much um, go to sleep as I die and reanimate. And uh, so I didn't even bother to go to sleep last night. There would have been no point because I wouldn't have woken up. So uh, right now I'm, uh, shall we say, physically here and um, trying to pump enough crack and meth into myself to uh, regain some semblance of functionality. And just for the, the tally books, that was a joke. <laughs> okay. For those with editing, editing a clip, uh, a side of video clip, audio clip in hand, Ready to uh, pounce, right? And so, anyway, uh, uh, as I uh, I asked Douglas to do this to comment on North Korea. Now, for those who have been listening to Douglas on his show, which is on Revolution Radio, which is on FreedomsLips dot com, and on Tuesday nights, I believe in the Central Time, it is uh, nine to eleven. Is that correct? In the central zone? Uh, no, sir. Uh, uh, it would be, uh, wait a second, it would be. Yes, you're absolutely okay. right. It's 10 to midnight Eastern, and it's 9 to 11 Central. You are absolutely okay. correct. Okay, so I've been listening uh, as I drive. You're able to download the archives uh, from the site, and uh, Douglas has uh, been talking about very, very many things. I recommend uh, to listen to it. I'm figuring a way how I can link to him without uh, raising the ire of Revolution Radio so to make it easier for people to get to it. So that, uh, but it's something I really recommend one listens to because I can't obviously cover the amount of time on my show uh, to get all of the stuff neatly tucked inside Douglas's head out there. And one of the things he commented on was his familiarity with the politics in Asia, being both born there, raised there, uh, and of the uh, culture uh, to some degree before coming here. Also, his work in a Presidio naval base. And his document destruction, uh, uh, cataloging, then destructing. Uh, so we can get a, a different view of uh, history, and in, in particular, to show North Korea. Now, we have these North Korean nuclear threats, and some people are, are taking it very seriously. Some people aren't. And almost everybody is giving it, I uh, perceived anyway, the wrong interpretation and uh, confirming that with some private talks with Douglas. And so... Um, one question I would, I'll ask a couple questions to start out, and then you can take us through history and whatnot. Uh, first off, do you think that North Korea does have a credible nuclear threat? Do you think he will actually do it? And do you think that the powers that be will use that for some nefarious covering of other things behind? 
Well, that's a complex series of questions, and thank you for presenting that. Uh, it'll force me to basically uh, get the chemistry of my brain working uh, to the point where we can discuss such things in detail. First thing I'd like to emphasize is the fact that uh, North Korea um, is properly, of course, referred to as the Democratic People's Republic of Korea. It is essentially a Stalinist dynasty. That's very important to emphasize because communism, like any faith or religion has a number of schisms and communism is very much an anti-faith, a counter-faith, a anti-theism and because there is a denial of the divinity uh, in toto, uh, in totality but uh, in particular uh, because the communism that originated uh, in the Eurasian landmass started with the Soviet Union and the, of course, the Leninist Revolution. There was very much specifically an anti-Christian element to communism. Now, the Koreans, of course, did not have a tremendous Christian um, cultural background. So the communism that manifested in Korea was almost... Uh, it was it was sui genre. It was very unusual. It was uh, uh, certainly totalitarian to the point of uh, pathology, um, as in all communisms, because there's no deity that's acknowledged. What develops instead is a cult of personality, considering whichever dictator is able to present themselves in the person of the divinity. And in this case, it was the uh, Kim uh, Jong dynasty, and Kim Jong Il. Uh, inherited that dynasty from his father. His his son has, of course, inherited it. So this is the longest running, indeed the only running, communist dynasty on earth. Their particular brand of communism is Stalinism as opposed to, say, Maoism or as opposed to, say, the Vietnamese who practice Leninism. And Maoism, by the way, it needs to be emphasized, is not practiced in China. Maoism is exported by the Chinese, but the Chinese at this point in history do not believe it, nor do they practice it, but they export it. So that is uh, exported into places like Nepal, uh, places like Peru, very backwards, undeveloped third world places. And North Korea itself, or the Democratic People's Republic of Korea on the northern half of the Korean Peninsula, has inherited technology that it has had an enormous amount of time to work on. The technology that it inherited was Japanese technology, which within the matrix of a very limiting and confining totalitarian society, they have worked with as best that they could. And uh, what they inherited from the Japanese was the fact that the Japanese uh, long before the Second World War, established themselves on the Korean Peninsula, the entire Korean Peninsula, and they did this out of necessity as far as they were concerned because Korea, geostrategically, as a peninsula, is essentially the geopolitical equivalent of Poland in Europe. And Poland in Europe is, of course, pretty much flat territory which you could skateboard across from Russia to Germany and from Germany back to Russia again. So because of that, Poland has had the great misfortune of serving as the bridge of invasion, the land route between the Germans and Russians counter-invading each other for quite some time till the point where the Poles have developed a tremendous hatred for both the Germans and the Russians and constantly fantasize quite vocally that uh, both the Germans and the Russians would annihilate each other and leave Poland to reclaim its uh, vast amount of empire that it had once ruled over um, close to a thousand years ago. Well, the same uh, goes for Korea. Korea was a very advanced uh, society. It was the, it invented the printing press. Uh, it used gunpowder in cannon. It actually um, floated the world's first ironclad warships long, hundreds of years, half a thousand years before the Monitor and the Merrimack. And they defeated the Japanese at sea using these ironclad so-called turtle ships. Now, uh, the samurai could not board them nor penetrate their armor. 
Uh, these were fantastic innovations uh, for their day, and because of that, the Koreans had expanded to be one of the larger land empires, which is barely known in the Western world. So, like the Poles, they had accomplished a, a great deal. Um, as time went on, unfortunately for them, many of their glories uh, faded uh, with the coming and going of various dynasties. And what happened ultimately was that they were conquered successively and divided successively between the Chinese and the Japanese because they serve as the only peninsular connection uh, as a convenient land route between Japan and China. Again, to put this into perspective for how close they are to Japan, you could drink a beer on a Korean beach, uh, throw it in the water, it will wash up on a Japanese beach, and vice versa. Uh, they're close enough where at their closest points from uh, various Japanese islands that um, border Korea in the maritime boundary sense, you, a healthy man could swim the distance just as a healthy man could swim the English Channel. So as a result, uh, anything that happens on the Korean Peninsula directly impacts the nation of Japan. Uh, this is why it's important to keep the Korean War that took place in the 1950s within context of the Second World War. America was still legally at war with Japan when the Korean War started, and of course, the MacArthur was fired before Japan was at peace with the United States. He was fired in 1951. Japan was not at peace with the United States until the Treaty of San Francisco went into effect on August 28th of 1952. So uh, we had a tremendous confluence of struggles that um, manifested in the Korean Peninsula, essentially becoming the battleground that Japan was supposed to be. The Americans had intended to divide Japan with the Soviets. There was supposed to be a North and South Japan. Japan's uh, victory conditions in World War II, uh, which could take another show to go into yet again, but we've gone into it before, essentially forced the Americans and the Soviets to divert their attentions away from Japan proper onto the peninsular area of Japan. And it's important to remember, Korea did not exist at that point in history, Korea had not existed for quite some time. Korea was part of Japan, just as the island on which I was born, the island of Taiwan, to which the nationalist government of China reestablished itself, relocated and reconstituted itself, was part of Japan. This was in the same sense that Poland had not existed for well over a uh, hundred years, if not several hundred years, because it had uh, basically devolved into an ethnicity that was occupied and divided and uh, essentially populated certain areas of Prussia and Russia. So just as the Poles were suddenly given a nation, essentially, by Woodrow Wilson, out of nothing, when the end of World War I and the so-called Spanish flu depopulated an enormous part of Europe, and the Europeans were unable to resist Americans redrawing their map, then suddenly a Poland which had not existed for um, countless generations was brought into existence. That was the same with Korea. There was no such thing as a Korea. There was a Korean peninsula on which a Korean ethnicity existed. That Korea was part of Japan integrally. It housed the largest industrial complex in all of Asia long before World War II. The Japanese had dammed the Yalu, the Chosen, and the Fusen rivers, and they used these massive rivers to generate an enormous amount of hydroelectric power. Uh, North Korea, which is still very heavily dependent on mining, uh, was at that time uh, known to be saturated in uranium ore deposits. The Japanese constructed what was known as Konan Complex, which was spelled K-O-N-A-N in Korean language. It's known as Hungnam Complex. And at this complex, the Japanese generated through hydroelectricity enough power that is so much power that it was equal to one third of the output of the entire Japanese archipelago. So that's an enormous amount of power they were using to process the uranium ore into atomic bombs with. So while this was taking place, then, of course, the war came to a close. 
take hours to cover that. We're not going to go in that direction except as it applies to Korea. The Japanese, of course, withdrew after taking the bombs themselves, but left the munitions making factory for atomic ordnance there in North Korea. It is that complex which the North Koreans have been using to build bombs ever since. It's important to remember the Americans were never able to penetrate Japanese air defenses through the archipelago of Japan to bomb the Conan complex. So the largest industrial complex in Asia, the atomic bomb manufacturing complex, was never bombed by the United States, was never reached by the United States. And as a result, the Japanese were able to use that as one of their factors in finishing off the war in the Pacific. It was also American- not acknowledged, uh, uh, at least throughout history that I have been taught, it was not acknowledged by the United States that have even existed, let alone making atom bombs. Right, of course, and that that goes without saying. The, uh, but in terms of the uh, what had happened with the Hungnam complex, this is why, and people can of course vet this and verify it. Uh, the Hungnam complex in North Korea became the very facility which the North Koreans were using for years. How to, would you spell that? Uh, can you spell that? The Hungnam. Yeah, Hungnam is spelled H-U-N-G-N-A-M. That would be the Korean language equivalent of the Japanese name for it, which would be Konan, K-O-N-A-N. So Konan uh, complex in uh, northern Korea was the largest industrial complex in Asia, surrounded by uranium ore deposits, producing an enormous amount of energy, uh, refining and processing uh, the uh, uranium into uh, atomic ordnance. This was ultimately used, of course, to create the Korean demilitarized zone. We have actually gone into that before. Um, but the important thing to remember about the Korean demilitarized zone, here's where some controversy comes in. There are people who argue against this. Uh, that is different from the records which I have seen. The records which I have seen uh, have stated that astronauts who have been on the moon without the aid of uh, a telescope through their vision lenses, uh, essentially were able to see for, through their face plates, essentially, were able to see with their naked eyes, so to speak, through the face plate the Great Wall of China. It was the only man-made object visible from the moon. The other thing which the astronauts claimed to be able to discern was the Korean demilitarized zone, which is, it goes to show you how large the Korean demilitarized zone is. And that, of course, uh, is large enough where it serves as a nature preserve for many animals, including the uh, Asian tiger, which would otherwise be extinct. And we so, talked on other shows that it was created by setting off a chain of nuclear bombs to stop the advance of Russia. And I'm yes. looking right now at the map of North Korea from Google without the border. I had the border on at first, then I turned it off, and you can see the border just like uh, this wave here where uh, the natural spacing is uh, still there from the nuclear bombs. Right. Yes. No, very much so. And keep in mind that like all uh, nuclear bombs at the time, Comparatively speaking, they were clean. Uh, by that, I mean that they uh, probably released, uh, well, most certainly released, uh, the same amount of dirty radioactivity that the bombs uh, did at Hiroshima and Nagasaki. That, of course, uh, has entirely uh, vanished at this point in terms of trace radioactivity. Functionally, it is truly non-existent. This is why I um, uh, find it so laughable when you hear people uh, make the claim that uh, these atomic bombs, uh, at, at that stage of development, we're not talking about hydrogen bombs. We're talking about what are uh, comparatively primitive firecrackers. And uh, as a result, uh, Hiroshima and Nagasaki are thriving cities today. Uh, you could go there with a Geiger counter and uh, try to sniff out radiation that's residual from the original atomic bombs. You're going to have a better chance of uh, detecting radiation coming down from Fukushima Daiichi than you would of getting radiation frets residual from the original atomic bombs. It is the same with the Korean Peninsula. At this point, it serves as the uh, nesting grounds for rare species of cranes, various other avians that would otherwise be extinct. So in a very real sense, it's become a very, um, it's become a blessing. If the Koreas ever reunite, then it will almost certainly be maintained as national parkland. So that is uh, the kind of um, strange future that we have. Let me jump in here for just that complex you're referring to. 
Conan. Not, yes. Yeah, Conan. Now that I'm seeing Hung Nam, I'm never going to be able to remember the originals. I apologize, but uh, uh, I'm looking at the, the references they're referring to of a fertilizer plant that's allegedly used to manufacture chemical weapons. Could that have been uh, that area, that plant, whatever, have been what we were talking about with the, the Japanese that have been used to create bombs or was something else? Oh, most certainly. Most certainly, they were all part of the same complex. As I said, it was the largest industrial complex in Asia. The uh, atomic uh, bomb processing was, the uranium enrichment was only one of its functions. Uh, obviously, uh, there were other units that were dealing with chemical weapons and biological weapons. It was all weapons of mass destruction. Actually, so, uh, uh, in, in Wikipedia, oddly enough, they're talking about this being, a, a, it was the site of Asia's first known cyclotron. It was constructed as part of the Japanese atomic program. But then they immediately segue into, at the surrender of Japan, it was seized by the Miss Soviets. Well, there you go. I mean, that's all part of the obfuscation that uh, you get. And, of course, it goes without saying that when the Japanese pulled out with the atomic bombs, there were enough atomic bombs produced where a number of them were left behind. That much I know by the records I was dealing with, and that is best uh, exposed through a book known as Operation Broken Reed. And Operation Broken Reed uh, deals with uh, one man. It was uh, written by Lieutenant Colonel Arthur Boyd, uh, last name spelled B-O-Y-D. And Arthur Boyd was with a very small group of special forces uh, operatives who was sent uh, through uh, North Korea, uh, allegedly disguised, or they were disguising themselves as captured prisoners of war. And uh, their job was to break out and uh, see if they could detect whether or not the Soviets had any atomic capability in theater. Now, keep in mind, this was after the Soviets had blown their first atomic bomb, which was 1949. The uh, Korean War on the peninsula started in 1950. And uh, when uh, that took place, it was literally one year after the Soviets had after the Soviets had blown their first atomic bomb. Well, what these men discovered was that the Soviets had a whole array of short-range bombers in theater uh, in the Korean Peninsula theater in Manchuria specifically, northern Manchuria, which they still occupied, and they were loaded with atomic weapons that were um, that they were set to drop. Now, how is it that the Soviets could blow one atomic bomb and suddenly have, and it took them years to do it. We're talking about uh, from 1945 to 1949 is um, uh, half a decade. And suddenly they've got a fleet of bombers with uh, medium range, uh, but uh, they've got them with atomic ordnance that they're prepared to drop. Obviously, it was all taken from the Japanese. So uh, Lieutenant Colonel Arthur Boyd uh, mentions that. Uh, he doesn't go very deeply into any Japanese connection because his whole point was just proving that the ordinance was there, which led to a big headache for Truman, led to Truman uh, believing that he couldn't go all the way in Korea because there was an in-theater capability of atomic retaliation. So this was all part of that whole Korean conundrum that the Americans were contending with in the 1950s. So, uh, but again, it obviously goes back to the Hong Nam complex. When the Soviets invaded, they most certainly uh, took everything that wasn't nailed down. But for them, that was the bombs because they invaded in 1945 and they really were not of the engineering or uh, technical acumen to identify what was valuable to strip to bring back home. Most everything they were stripping was things that the troops wanted immediately, which was woman, cigarettes, uh, jackasses for food. Uh, they were basically operating on the level of Genghis Khan. So that's something that very few people tend to remember in this day and age because they project a technological veneer of, on the Soviet army which did not exist. And uh, the end result was, of course, the uh, many aspects of the atomic facilities remained intact. The Koreans took over. This is why, however, they haven't really improved upon them because of their own uh, retardation that their totalitarian society projects upon their ability to progress uh, technologically. So for the longest period of time, 
they were blowing uh, basically World War II era uranium bombs. And anybody can vet that and look that up and say, good God, why are they bothering? Why are they blowing this? And they're still stuck in the World War II era. Well, that's because that's what they had the equipment to blow. Their intent was to put it on missiles. But the reality is the missiles are very much a distraction. If they were ever to strike at America, they would not be using missiles in a long range or even medium range ballistic sense. So uh, that's something we can certainly go into. Uh, the history of the Korean Peninsula um, encompasses both North and South, and America's involvement with that began directly after the American Civil War. Uh, we would like to emphasize to our listenership today is the commemorative anniversary date of the fall of Fort Sumter. So uh, this was essentially the beginning of the Civil War between the states in the United States. It would be the anniversary of its formal announcement would be tomorrow. And uh, there we have a deep connection to Korea because it was directly after that American civil war between the states that the Americans invaded the Korean Peninsula. I just want to mention so, uh, the, the Korean Times has an article uh, that came out in 2009 that I will link to this too, uh, that does talk about proof that uh, Japan did have plants in Korea uh, which made and tested nuclear bombs. I mean, so this is not just coming out of thin air on your side, even though it's been dealt with and covered up or uh, whatever you want to call it, polluted. If you get out of the American press, you do see it uh, spoke openly. Oh, yeah. Well, that, that tells us quite a bit about the American press. People might find it strange, but in our uh, conversation, we will almost certainly cover South Korea as much as we will North Korea because of the enormous impact that uh, both Koreas have had on uh, America. Now, I would like to emphasize before we forget, uh, there are... are um, Two points that we certainly want to cover. Uh, one of them is, of course, the fact that uh, when uh, James Arthur Yanchik was on my show last night, uh, Saturday Night Firing Lines, he brought up the fact that we have uh, the North Koreans essentially giving us a Sputnik moment and uh, how this has kind of been uh, sedged into uh, in the minds of certain people as uh, Planet X. Yeah, uh, let, me, let, me just go, let me just say that for those who didn't hear it, of course. Uh, I got email from a person who is a noted Planet X supporter, the classic Planet X, Nibiru, whatever, and that he was refuting a, 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 an article written by a guy who was saying that the new, the North Korea does have a satellite uh, floating over the United States, at this moment, uh, coming across to the eastern parts, that he theorized contained a nuclear weapon which would be used to create a, a, a pulse. There's a theory of a pulse weapon going off, which would create uh, technical havoc. And this uh, individual was writing, refuting that, saying that it was a cover story for the sun sending off a pulse uh, due to its reaction with Planet X. Which, uh, yeah, I just, I, you know... I respect people's opinions, and, and I respect their delusions as well, but it just amazes me how everything gets back to Planet X. Everything yeah, gets back to Planet X. But, I mean, is, yeah. is there a possible uh, possibility of, of them th having the forethought to and the technical ability to make a nuke, raise it, put it in orbit, and do something like that? No, that's a that's a that's a good point. I I don't. Well, let's put it this way: the uh, Korean people, uh, both North and South, are not stupid. The uh, Korean people have, uh, as I said, were one of the more advanced empires in the world uh, many uh, hundreds of years ago, and uh, they did uh, marvelous innovations. And uh, one of the innovations that keeps North Korea afloat is the fact that the Koreans invented the printing press hundreds of years before Gutenberg. And what the Koreans did with this printing press was, of course, they used it for uh, iconographic uh, characters. Uh, the Korean language is, if you ever take a look at the Korean um, uh, iconography, uh, it, you, we can't call it an alphabet because uh, they use characters just as the Chinese and the Japanese do. But if you look up Korean characters uh, on uh, line and just do a search engine uh, survey of how Korean uh, writing looks, 
you will be impressed at how uh, vaguely computer-like it appears. It appears very much like um, binary numbers, in a sense. Imagine uh, all zeros and ones, but uh, with a lot more, um, shall we say, uh, additional, uh, I, I guess we would call them... Uh, um, aspects that will uh, lend towards a uh, language as opposed to simply something to be interpreted by a computer which processes much quicker. Because the human mind cannot process an enormous amount of information, the human mind needs far more input than just ones and zeros. But beyond uh, that qualification, the Korean language looks extremely futuristic, extremely modern, even though it's hundreds of years old, and that is because it was literally designed around the Korean printing press, because a printing press obviously is not going to be able to handle the iconography of the uh, intense um, shall we say, flowery nature of the Chinese and Japanese languages as they existed and uh, to a lesser extent still exist. They have undergone massive simplification. Uh, but uh, at the time that the Koreans developed their language, they engineered it towards printability. And uh, for that reason, they are still masters of the printing press to the extent where North Korea's entire economy in reality is based on the counterfeiting of American money. This is one of the reasons why America's economy has continued to sink and why we've been hit with such an inflationary spiral that is never acknowledged. We continually acknowledge the depression aspects of our economy, and well, we should, but very few people tend to acknowledge the inflationary aspects of our economy. Well, the reason why is because of Korean counterfeiting, uh, specifically North Korean counterfeiting. To put this into perspective, the overwhelming uh, majority of times that the United States has changed its bills, uh, particularly its $100 bills, is because every time the North Koreans will catch up and find a new way to print an exact counterfeit that will pass even scanning. And uh, so the... Let me stop North for one second to go back before we go too far. I was going to comment on the language. It kind of looks like something you would use in a movie uh, to depict alien languages. Yes. Yeah. yes. In fact, I got a, I have a Roswell alien out there, which is a gift for my sister a while back, and I, I swear it is what's on it. Or something similar. So somebody must have used that as a model for that. But I'm sorry, I digress. Right. Go ahead. Oh, no, I'm certain it was used as a template because it had, it, not only is it Asian, but it is also streamlined. So it is exactly what many of the people were seeing at Roswell, which was, as I said, was Japanese military stenciling, which would be very similar looking. Uh, instead of the flowery cursive nature of the iconographs, you would see something like that that has become very stilted, uh, but is still iconographic, which looks truly alien. And so uh, I understand completely what you're saying, and hopefully other people will appreciate what you're observing. Uh, and uh, definitely, uh, and if you listen to their language, because it... Um, if you ever hear Korean language, guaranteed, uh, you will be able to discern it very much from Chinese or Japanese or any other Asian language quite readily because it's very monotonal. Uh, Korean language is very like, um, like this would be an example of the word thank you in Korean, kamsamnidom. And it's just basically everything that they say maintains a very um, distinct monotonic. Um, there's not much fluctuation at all. It's not very expressive. It's almost computer-like. And again, it was because it was all engineered around that early invention of the printing press. So I definitely uh, have not been in any Korean restaurants. Uh, we have uh, uh, restaurants uh, around us. It must have been uh, uh, Chinese because there's a lot of uh, up and down you know, right. yelling up and down. I mean, one time I got nervous when I was in a restaurant. Yeah. Uh, a guy did something wrong, apparently, and this guy was yelling at him. I'm like, oh, my God, he's going to kill him, you know? And then it was just uh, went back to normal, just like that. And he went out and talked to the person. I'm like, yes, and then well, what else would you like with that? I'm like, uh, wow. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, that's 
that, that's pretty much it. By the way, uh, uh, Cantonese uh, Chinese, which is the Hong Kong area of Chinese, which most of the people heard around the rest of the world for uh, hundreds of years, because all of the overseas scattered Chinatowns were mostly uh, Cantonese speaking, uh, Chinese populated. Uh, that has nine tones. Uh, every character essentially pretty much has nine different ways of pronouncing that character, and each pronunciation will radically change the meaning of that character. And uh, the Mandarin Chinese, which of course is spoken by uh, the Northern Chinese and also of course on Taiwan, because all of the migrants who reestablished the nationalist government of China on Taiwan were from the North, uh, that is a far more uh, flowery, poetic, smoother language. It has only four tones. So you have only four ways of screwing up what you're saying uh, based on the character that you're reading. So uh, that uh, is, of course, uh, much more euphonic, in my opinion, and uh, that uh, obviously come, you know, coming from that background. So uh, I always have fun making fun of Cantonese speaking. If I can ask you, just for heck of it, you know, speaking these languages, uh, and, and I'm assuming those were your first languages, uh, uh, Chinese or Mandarin, or, uh, what what does English sound like to the ears of someone who was native from that area? I mean, what, when they hear it, it uh, for the first time, is it is it sound? I don't mean, know how, how to describe it. Like, is it sound boring? Is it sound uh, so foreign that it's like, like it's almost the same way as if I was to hear? Uh, you know, I'm, I'm just interesting. It, well, it's an interesting point because the, um, the because of the European uh, incursions into Asia for such a long period of time, I don't believe there ever was that sense of alienness to it for several generations. Mm. By the time my mother was born in 1923 and she was born in Tokyo, um, her father was Chinese, but her mother was Japanese, and uh, which ought to go a long way towards showing the um, the myth of Japanese racism if they would tolerate a Chinese man marrying a Japanese woman in their capital city. But my point is that um, by that time, the Dutch and the Portuguese and the Spanish had been in Asia for uh, well over several hundred years. Mm -hmm. uh, and so the um, at least close to 200 years. I mean, they were there before America was discovered. So uh, at that point, there was enough of an exposure to European languages where uh, there wasn't that alienness. Before World War II, before Pearl Harbor, 10% uh, of the Japanese military or 10% of the uh, Japanese population that got drafted into the military spoke English. Uh, of course, the American equivalent was that functionally zero spoke Japanese. So you're, you're talking about there was already very much... I guess that question really can't be answered because of the one wayness. I mean, when I was in Europe, everyone spoke two, three, four, five languages, and you know, and they just went back and forth and this and that. And I, I just was like, wow, this is blowing my mind because I maybe because I have the dyslexia stuff as well. I don't know, but hearing the phonetics of it or the non phonetics of it in my way is like, I would uh, it would be very hard. I guess if you're stuck. In somewhere where you either starve or learn the language, you figure a way to learn the language. <laughs> oh, so, yeah. But anyway, I digress, no, no. and I didn't mean to derail that, but it was just kind of, it's fascinating to me. When I hear accents, I think of them as so rich and interesting and musical, and I hear English, or American, that is, and it just seems to me so boring, but maybe because that's because I'm in it. Right, right. Well, uh, it's certainly Cantonese, and again, I say this as a northerner. Basically, I, I, of course, I've probably expressed this before, um, northern uh, Chinese uh, view uh, Cantonese-speaking Chinese in the same way that Nordic, Alpine, Italians view uh, Sicilians. Uh, so there's this uh, enormous kind of uh, cultural, uh, shall we mm. say, they disparage each other quite a bit. So I always have fun with that. But uh, the Cantonese language truly is a fairly brutal language. It uh, is uh, essentially it's very harsh sounding and that's a lot of the shouting that you picked up was mm. the Cantonese almost certainly and uh, the um, but the um, the Mandarin language which was spoken by the Mandarins or the noble class was the literati was essentially meant for um, more of a poetic expression but uh, in terms of the um, the Korean situation I do want to address the fact that what blows my mind, is what you, of course, were educated in while you were growing up, because this brings us back to the Planet X. I right. do want to address Planet X while we're here, because it segues into the Korean uh, situation because of the current American alternative 
information uh, media community's obsession with Planet X. So uh, if they're saying that the satellite is some kind of uh, engineered cover-up for Planet X, I'm going to assume that they mean that the satellite uh, cover story was engineered by the Americans uh, to cover up the threat of Planet X and how it will uh, interact with the sun and create a sunburst. So uh, to put this into perspective for uh, the listenership with the military records that I was dealing with, uh, the cosmic um, influx of asteroids and comets, there is no one who is going to be able to handle them other than perhaps, with the ghost of a chance, the military. Because all of our space programs have essentially been, until very, very recently, military programs. And all of NASA, National Aeronautics and Space Administration, was essentially a quasi-military organization whose staff consisted entirely of military astronauts for the longest period of time. So it's only recently that we've had a kind of civilian perspective on space, and uh, the end result is that uh, the uh, United States military has done its best to make observations about incoming potential threats from space, namely um, cometoids, bolides, uh, asteroids, asteroids, and uh, the conclusion that they drew from many years of study was that we have a dark companion star. We are, like many other stars in the galaxy, a uh, binary star solar system. And uh, this other binary dark star was given the name Nemesis. Now, there was a lot of confusion because you have academic confusion, you have academic um, researchers who are operating without the military grants, and then they come to their own conclusions based on what information they can access. But the military does take its time at various uh, observatories. They uh, take their time at the Hubble telescope when it was operating. I, I'm, to tell the truth, I don't even remember whether they ultimately shut it down. I know there was a lot of talk about that, a lot of talk about trying to extend its life. But uh, they certainly had their time at Hubble while it was operating. And uh, if it's still operating, they still would have their time at it. So the military has taken this time to do observations at places where civilian astronomers with their own agendas are not going to look. Civilian astronomers are very interested in the larger scheme of things, the larger cosmos. The military took it uh, very immediate uh, in terms of what they're looking for. And so they um, found that when you look for brown dwarf stars, you find out that you're almost doubling the number of stars in the galaxy. Um, and uh, what they have found is that most uh, stellar systems are binary, and our particular binary companion is very far out in what is known as the Kuiper disk. And the Kuiperoid disk is essentially where the vast amount of primordial matter came from that uh, populates a lot of our inner solar system. And what happens is that this binary brown dwarf star, very difficult to see unless you know what you're looking for, you know which direction to look. Uh, in fact, it's literally physically impossible to see because it is on a enormous elliptical orbit and it won't be back towards where we could really see it uh, physically for another probably 250 million years. So uh, this is one reason why every uh, half a hundred million years, every 500 million years or so, or 250 million years, people can look this up. The extinctions happen like clockwork. The mass extinctions pretty much happen as if someone presses a button and uh, just starts rewind or, or erase. And uh, the reason for that is because when that binary dwarf star makes its orbit or completes its circuit, uh, it comes back through that Kuiper disk and hurls so much matter into our inner solar system that it basically wipes the slate clean because there's too many incoming bolides, asteroids, and uh, celestial objects to be absorbed by the mass of Jupiter and the mass of Saturn. So uh, these two gas giants uh, have protected us 
with any other incoming strikes in general. Most of the time, their mass is so large. As a matter of fact, the magnetic, uh, shall we say, um, it's not the atmosphere. It would be the magnetic field of Jupiter is the largest object in our solar system. It is larger than our sun. So with that kind of mass, these gas giants pull in almost everything that would otherwise wipe out life from our planet. But uh, once every 250 million to half a, million, half a hundred million years, Nemesis uh, is throwing in so much matter they can't absorb it all, and Earth pretty much gets wiped clean uh, in that, uh, that frame of time. Now, uh, the last mass extinction we had was the Permian extinction was the largest extinction uh, it, that ever occurred. 90% of all life, well over 90% of all life on Earth was wiped out. And uh, the end result was, of course, the dinosaurs were able to evolve. They faced a much smaller extinction that might have been a bolide strike, again, combined with volcanism, various other factors. There's still a lot of controversy considering what wiped out the dinosaurs. But nevertheless, if you look at the clockwork mechanism of mass extinctions, it really didn't deviate much from the pattern. So if people were to look it up, they'd find out what I'm talking about. And uh, the ma next mass extinction is predicted, like clockwork, 250 million years from now when Nemesis again makes its circuit. But no planet X, per se, is going to come into our inner solar system. There are planets around planet X, excuse me, around Nemesis. And uh, the planets around Nemesis, because it is a star, it does have its own orbital solar system. These uh, planets, you have some that are the size of ice giants. Uh, ice giants would be like Uranus or Neptune, and some would be the size of Mars or Earth. Now, keep in mind, the Kuiperoid belt is full of billions of objects, many of which are the size of Mars or Earth. So uh, the idea of a number of them being picked up into Nemesis's orbit or knocked out of Nemesis's orbit every time it passes through is, of course, not far-fetched at all, but probably inevitable. So the uh, idea of one of those planets coming into our inner solar system is not far-fetched. It would cometize long before it got into our area of the solar system. It could still do an enormous amount of damage. It uh, more than likely, because of the amount of space, would not crash into us. But nevertheless, if there is some kind of planet coming into the inner solar system, it would be around that period of time. But there's nothing, nothing that is heading into our solar system right now of that mass. Uh, because everyone would see it in terms of the um, astronomy. Uh, they would miss something that would be large. You could have something the size of Mount Everest and they'd miss it. But no one's going to miss something the size of a planet. It would just be physically impossible. Right. I mean, a couple, couple of things I was, as I was letting you do this. We talked earlier so I could actually listen to you and also read. Uh, uh, according to, uh, of course, I'm looking at, again, Wikipedia, which is uh, rolling the dice for its uh, benefit. But they do mention the WISE project and the reason right. why these authors of this article uh, disagree with what you're saying is that the WISE project would have seen it if it existed because they've measured uh, everything into the infrared out to 10 years out, 10 light years out, and uh, and it would have would have seen it. Um, but that's just the only thing I can add to this as far as, a, you know, there's people uh, who don't agree with the theory, but they're not really saying much. They're arguing about the extinctions when they occurred, is there a pattern, blah, blah, blah. But that mm -hmm. would be the only thing to... Uh, bring up from this. Right. Well, the extinctions do happen like clockwork. That's inarguable because that's in the sedimentary layers. That uh, is uh, of, of, uh, that's irrefutable. The, the question would be, what is it that's causing the extinctions? Is it a uh, bolides coming in from outside, which is, of course, almost certain. Uh, the um, Kuiperoid disk is, is definitely exists. That is also inarguable at this point because of the fact that they are discovering Sedna, uh, uh, what that, right. that right. And, and plus, plus, just to get down to it, I mean, there's our cosmic comets coming in here to come from somewhere. You know, I mean... Well, the comets would theoretically come from the Oort cloud. The Oort cloud, of yeah, course, is... Theoretical. That, that's 
yeah, is is theoretical, but it, it probably I, I would think there's no reason why it wouldn't exist. It seems to logically that would be, but but the, yeah, the comets are different though. The comets are not say um, uh, they're they're different, and uh, the um, and of course uh, Mr. James McKenney would have much to say about that. But yeah, I mean uh, uh, the thing is is that we're talking about uh, something that's pretty large and has at least a infrared signature. Uh, now, of course, they found many of brown dwarfs uh, around, in and around our solar system. And, of course, they could just simply, you know, a person who would want to argue would say, well, they're just keeping it quiet or what have you. But the the real problem, I think, besides this extinction event, is some object, be it a mountain-sized uh, asteroid or whatever, getting off course so that it would come from behind the sun, which actually happened a couple of times where they were panicking whether or not it was going to hit the earth and it was it passed but no one knew it was coming because it came from behind the sun you can't see things coming in that orbit behind the sun but if it was big enough it, it would have to take time and then there would be time to see it unless you want to rewrite physics which for example Nancy Leader has done by saying that it is hiding on the other side of the star which I, I obviously can't accept uh, right. The, the Well, um, the physicists would argue, or uh, cosmologists would argue, that if anything were behind the sun, that we would actually uh, be able to uh, discern the gravitational impact on right. the rest of the solar system. And the uh, so there's logic in that, and also in terms of the uh, what is uh, hidden in the cosmos. That uh, that that is, I think, um, something that we could argue uh, till the cows come home. Right, and uh, I don't want to get but, too far from from, from Korea. Yeah. But the reason why you brought this right. up was that when I was in yeah. school as a uh, grammar school as a kid, uh, it was commonly theorized and accepted that there was a binary star, since most stars are binary that the sun probably has a binary star that was uh, uh, also could be measured by the perturbation of orbits. The sun itself is wobbling around uh, in the galaxy. Why would it be doing that? You know, most things would travel in a, you know, basically a straight line, uh, for lack of a better phrase. But this is actually wobbling. So what is, what is helping the wobble? And uh, I'm assuming it's not a weeble, but it would be a... a uh, it would be a planet. I mean, a a a, a dark um, star companion. Star companion. And the only reason why this is even worth anything is that why would the powers that be apparently be against this theory, and um, why would the Planet X people ignore this theory and the evidence you put up? That's kind of fascinating to me. And one would be that they don't want people to know that. These events do happen because we might actually realize that things are, aren't as important as we might think they would be. And, um, uh, com you know, like uh, what what uh, the latest uh, supermodels are doing when we have to prepare for destruction of life at some point in the future uh, and so on. Well, the um, the it's so far out in the future that uh, I'm sure that no one is really concerned about it. Certainly, what they've decided was it was certainly not a threat. Yeah, uh, that one. But see, I don't. I don't. I won't personally rule out something coming in, even though it's smaller, can still do quite a bit of damage and upset things. Right now, this whole planet is you know, economically and social and politically, you know, really sensitive. So if you threw a mountain-sized thing and hit the earth it would cause trouble <laughs> you know well uh, i'm not arguing yeah. against the potential of a uh mount everest sized bolide even coming out of uh shall we say left field uh there's plenty of uh near earth objects that um they never seem to find until the last minute right. and it's not because they're hiding it it's because they literally don't see it until the last minute and uh this is one reason why um it's far easier to discern threats that are coming out from a further distance. Right. Uh, but at the same time, the uh, impression that I got, not that we want to dwell on this because we'll do this an entire program on this <laughs> in the future almost certainly. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the reason that they were hiding it was because the federal government itself concluded that it is quite probable that life had evolved on it at some point in the past. Uh, that there was perhaps a, uh, that it still might harbor life that had adapted 
to its very strange environment. So that was something they wanted to pursue in great secrecy uh, because it wouldn't be the object itself that would be a potential security threat, but rather what might source from the object. Right, okay. So oh, that, we'll that. That we'll, we'll, that's, that's, it, we'll, and we'll, we'll without go into that. Back to yeah. uh, uh, the whole point we segued on this. So back to, right. is it, is it uh, I mean, you're, you've made a case that the Korean people had the tech, technological ability, uh, but do you think that this would be in their, uh, uh, I, don't, I don't know, plan of attack or whatnot to put up a satellite that would have uh, a nuclear bomb well, satellite, in it, and would it be yeah, the, discovered? Well, the satellite is quite real. It was supposed to be a communication satellite. What it is doing instead of orbiting at the normal, uh, shall we say, height of a communication satellite is that it is at very uh, low Earth orbit. Um, it's passed over the United States uh, almost 30 times in the past few months. It's basically passing over the United States about once a day. So uh, with that in mind, it is very definitely something that has as the um, American military communications uh, going at high speed where they've been talking about this. They talked about two uh, North Korean subs that kind of went off their sonar, so to speak. Um, it's important to emphasize that Korea has a fleet of well over half a thousand subs, about 600 subs. Most of them are what we would consider Coast Guard subs. They are uh, very small subs with a crew of about half a dozen men that were manufactured in Yugoslavia before its collapse. And these would not be what the United States is worried about. If it's worried about some Korean subs disappearing, it would be because they're uh, longer distance subs. Now, what is interesting about this is what I've often stated in the past. Uh, in order for an electromagnetic pulse to do the maximum damage over the continental United States, um, if you only had one shot you would want it to be uh, right over Kansas, uh, directly over Kansas, would pretty much uh, give you the best chance of blanketing uh, a great deal, if not the totality of the continental United States, depending at what height it was uh, blown. Now, uh, the um, reality is, of course, you would want to make sure if you were going to go for the kill shot and just totally blanket the United States with an EMP pulse, you would blanket it both from over Kansas and from each coast. So you've got the potential that the American government was concerned with of a triangulation of the satellite directly pulsing, we'll use that term, over the United States, the center of the continental United States, over Kansas, and the two Korean subs both launching something vertically from either coast. Now, as I've said before, I've described this in detail on my own program. If electromagnetic pulsation were to take place with that triangulation, guaranteed you would pretty much, if they bombs work, if they didn't fizzle, if they weren't duds, if they went out with a uh, real EMP burst, you would do to the United States what the United States did to Al-Iraq, what the United States did to Serbia. And what the United States did was it destroyed the electronic infrastructure with the electromagnetic pulse bombs. And uh, the EMP bombs were such, of course, that it's a genocidal act. Basically, you're shutting down hospitals. You're shutting down the police ability to respond to emergency calls. You're shutting down uh, the plumbing. You're shutting down uh, the well water. You're shutting down access to oil and fuel. So all of that would happen to the United States, and everyone in the world would sit back and laugh and say it couldn't happen to a nicer guy. Uh, and everyone would basically not feel sorry for the United States at all because that's what the United States has done to so many other people. But uh, what would happen to the United States? Well, guaranteed, 90% die off in one year. If this were to happen and the Soviet, you know, excuse me, the North Koreans went for a decapitation strike, the only thing the Americans could do would be to what they're doing now. The U.S. Navy is deploying a HARP platform, the SBX-1. Uh, now, this is a huge sea base. That's what the SB stands for, sea base X-band radar to the Korean Peninsula, which is basically... Um, extremely low frequency. Now, as I've said before, uh, ELF cannot be used as an offensive 
weapon. It is electromagnetic pulsation, which triggers earthquakes. But the fact that they're moving such a huge asset right off the Korean coast shows me that that would be like a strike back plan. See, all of this crap with the missiles is just that. It's just crap. No one is going to launch a long range ballistic missile at the United States. And the United States isn't going to launch a long range ballistic missile at anyone else because both sides know the long range ballistic missiles don't work. Uh, North Korea knows that from hard experience with its testing. The Americans know that from all of their years of scamming the American public with the idea, the fantasy of nuclear missiles and the nuclear strikes and all the rest of that. They know for a fact, however, all the scientists and engineers know that the vast majority of missiles would blow up in their silos. The vast majority of them would launch and then come back down and hit the ground where they were launched from. A number of them would blow up in the sky over the United States and EMP it to death. But almost none of them would make it to the Soviet Union. And they all knew that. <laughs> so that's why the United States uh, would never strike back at North Korea with nuclear missiles because it can't. This is why it's never responded to what is essentially an act of war on the part of the North Koreans, which has been to essentially eviscerate its economy by printing American money to the point where they flood it, the world market, with American currency that is all World of Warcraft money and Monopoly money. So with that in mind, we're faced with a situation where, for instance, the young girl who you've spoken to, uh, my secretarial assistant, Noreen Halpan, uh, who is uh, half Jewish, half Japanese American, uh, so she refers to herself as double Jap. Uh, don't anybody else refer to her as that, please. Uh, that, that's, she, she has a sense of humor about herself, which I don't really share. Uh, but at any rate, her father um, worked with the Secret Service. And the Secret Service, of course, is primarily responsible for interdicting counterfeiting. And he was stationed in Japan. Now, uh, what on earth is a Secret Serviceman who's interdicting counterfeiting doing in Japan? He was stationed there pretty much during the Korean War era period, close thereby between Korea and uh, Vietnam truly escalating. And uh, so when he was there, the reason uh, I explained to her, because she didn't know why he was there, uh, I explained to her it was quite obvious. That's where he met her mother, by the way. Uh, it, the reason he was there is to interdict all the Korean counterfeit money that was entering Japan, where it essentially is flooded into the rest of the world market. That's its entry point. So this is why you had American Secret Service men on site in Japan desperately trying to put their fingers in the dike uh, while the Koreans flooded the rest of the world with phony American dollars through the Japanese economy, which is truly global. So that is um, the situation that we've been faced with that has been whittling, uh, uh, eviscerating the American economy for years. And the Americans have been unable to do anything about it. Nothing. Except, other keep, than, except keep changing the currency. Yeah, except change, keep changing the currency. Uh, because their original uh, war on the Korean Peninsula uh, ended uh, quite... Uh, in Columni, uh, it was not a, uh, a, a glorious victory uh, by any way, shape, or form, and America has never experienced such since World War I, if you could count creating a desert of dead bodies and calling it peace. So uh, the result was, of course, America is very much at the mercy of North Korea. Now, that should be frightening for anyone to think about. So what has this led to? This has led to America being very much at the mercy of South Korea. <laughs> In many now, ways. now, why? If if this was a legitimate, uh, as far as I know about nuclear weapons, they you know they're pretty hard to blow up. I mean, you you can blow up a nuclear weapon, and it'll just be like blowing up a television set or something. Other than that, other than the radioactive material being spread about, as opposed to blowing up a TNT bomb, which would then blow up. You know, so what would be wrong with them just shooting it out of the sky as a preemptive strike with some? Uh, it, it's simply that they're unable to. You think? Now, you're talking about um, the Americans, the Koreans, or, or, or the Ameri both. What the I'm, Americans what shooting this satellite out of the sky with some, you know, uh, oh, propaganda. Oh, thank you for asking yeah. that. Yes. Well, the, the reason for that, I am assuming, would be the same reason that Emperor Hirohito uh, had to absorb 
the nuclear terror strikes against Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Now, the Japanese, of course, as I've emphasized before, have developed, had developed the PEGI, what was, uh, had the codename of the PEGI, what in Japan was the Hiryu, or the Flying Dragon. Uh, this uh, medium-range bomber was very adaptable, and they had adapted it into the perfect B-29 killer. Uh, it was, uh, had a recoilless cannon mounted in the B-29 killer variants that easily disintegrated B-29s in midair without the B-29s being able to strike back because it was able to fire its recoilless cannon at a range that was much further than their own defensive ar armaments, uh, machine guns in their ball turrets could reach. Their machine guns and their ball turrets could not defend them from these long range strikes from the Hiryu or Flying Dragon or what the Americans codenamed the Peggies. So why didn't he just send one of them up as he easily could have to have taken out the Enola Gay or box car? Because he knew through his, uh, his, his scientists that this would result in an electromagnetic pulse that would take out a good deal. Well, that's that's what I'm that's what I'm wondering about uh, because uh, you have to. Uh, I mean, nuclear bombs are don't have blow up material in there. They have to be. They have to have this trigger mechanism to create it. So you could literally, you know, shoot a nuclear weapon out of the sky and it would just disintegrate and fall apart. It wouldn't explode like if it was full of dynamite. As far as I know, that's how they work. They're they, they're not this. Uh, not, it's not like. Uh, Dynamite or nitroglycerin, where if you shake it, it'll blow up. It, it it would just fall apart and become useless. No, you're absolutely correct. That, however, is not necessarily the case because the original World War II bombs were so incredibly fragile. Uh, to give you an example of this, the um, we're not talking about again hydrogen bombs or okay. uh, these amazingly complex what you're thinking of are basically thermonuclear weapons uh, to put this into perspective for you uh, there was a uh, doctor whose name I believe was Sloten and um, the man was basically an idiot and uh, he uh, was a physicist and what he had done was he was basically um, masturbatorially uh, playing around with what was known as the demon core of the original atomic bomb uh, for the Manhattan Project. And I've mentioned this on air before, and I've used rather flippant terminology because there's no point in uh, uh, basically always being so technical that the listenership uh, will just stop listening to what I'm saying. But Dr. Louis Sloten, last name is spelled S-L-O-T-I-N, basically was so cavalier uh, about the uh, A-bomb that he basically, when um, Dr. David Bradley, who was one of the MDs who was a, responsible for the medical health of the various physicists in the Manhattan Project, he walked into a room one time and this idiot, Dr. Sloten, basically uh, threw him uh, basically the core of the atomic bomb. Just tossed it to him like it was a baseball. Said, here, catch! And, of course, like a medicine ball, he was grabbing something that was the size of, of a tennis ball but weighed as much as a bowling ball. Now, he almost dropped it, and at that point, I made the comment like, oh, yeah, and then he, he they could have been uh, an enormously catastrophic consequence. And people were saying exactly what you were saying. Oh, well, it doesn't work like that. Well, you know, believe it or not, it does. <laughs> okay, well, I mean, I, I'm not saying I'm a physicist. I'm just sharing what I've known from it. Oh, oh that, yeah. I'm, that, I'm they're, yeah. that they're not I, I, volatile I, I, in and of itself, but they could be, right. uh, are focused to be. Right, yeah, no, you're absolutely right. But to put that into perspective, Dr. Uh, Sloten masturbatorily used to take two halves of the demon core. Again, we're talking about this uh, this uh, ball that he threw at uh, Dr. Bradley. And he used to like put them close together so that he could hear the Geiger counter uh, make noise. And this was how he would contemplate uh, and meditate uh, while he was thinking. So he kept putting these closer and closer together all the time and just hearing the Geiger counter go <laughs> up. I'm and listening, down. I'm watching. Sloten yeah. accidentally began a fission reaction, which released a burst of heart of energy radiation. He was went to, and died from the sickness. I like that. Sloten accidentally began a fusion <laughs> reaction sure. after hearing your narrative there. 
Yeah, well, the uh, sky around him, all of the air around him turned a shade of blue, which you never want to see. It's called Cherenkov blue, which means that the air around him ionized. And he essentially disintegrated um, over the next, uh, believe it or not, 24 to 48 hours. And uh, so he was conscious all the time that he was dying. As his body uh, essentially uh, disintegrated, he was conscious and aware uh, throughout that entire period of time of what was happening to him. Uh, and again, of course, it's like kind of like the Jackass series, you know, where somebody is like setting their um, anus on fire with a Molotov cocktail and, uh, you know, they burn their testicles off and you just look at them and you... You, you you know they were asking for it, uh, but at any rate, uh, here's a picture the, too. They have a picture of it's the, the name of the picture is tickling the dragon's tail, and it's him fooling around with this uh, this uh, cylinder. Brilliant, brilliant. You so, see this one? Oh. tickling the dragon's <laughs> tail. Nice. Yeah. These are the guys making these things. Wonderful. Yeah. Oh yeah. They were idiots. <laughs> Uh, just because you're intelligent doesn't mean you have any common sense or wisdom, I assure you. The, um, but at any rate, the, there's quite a difference between the two, as you well know, uh, elements of uh, human consciousness. But at any rate, the point that I'm making is that um, that happened uh, several times with the atomic bomb in many different ways that uh, threatened the project at several stages. And uh, what the atomic bombs were were actually extremely volatile and extremely fragile because they were meant to pretty much um, blow. Uh, one of the problems that they had was to keep them from not blowing. So the kind of bombs they were working with at the time were not the way we think of atomic bombs or nuclear weapons now. And you're absolutely right. What uh, the concern was on the part of the Japanese would be if they shot the uh, B-29 out of the sky that they would spread radiation and, again, electromagnetic pulse, because if they did blow the plane, the Americans could conceivably, if, since they were going to die anyway, if they were being blown out of the sky, just set the bomb off. And that was something that, believe it or not, happened with box car. Box car, as I've explained um, to you before, but I don't know if I've explained it in depth to our listenership, its target was the Kokura National Arsenal of Japan. And when it went to the uh, target zone, then it faced so much anti-aircraft defense, which the Americans claimed did not exist. They claimed that there was inclement cloud cover and they could not aim. Now, of course, the absurdity in that is, of course, you've got not just an atomic bomb, they had the plutonium bomb, the largest weapon in uh, the human inventory extant at that point in history. I mean, how much do you need to aim with a effing plutonium bomb? You don't need <laughs> to aim at all. And uh, so the point is that they received gunfire and uh, a round penetrated one of their fuel tanks, which wound up leaking high uh, grade, uh, highly flammable aviation fuel into the bomb bay. So you had the most powerful weapon in the human inventory saturated in aviation fuel that was highly flammable. And at that point, they panicked, and that's when uh, the Captain Sweeney dropped it in a sheer uh, panicked retreat over Nagasaki, which was not the intended target. And anyone can vet this. They can look up the fact the intended target was Kokura. Uh, it never made it into the history books, but if you look it up, you'll find what I say is true. K-O-K-U-R-A, Kokura, the Japanese national arsenal. Uh, Sweeney himself later uh, admitted that his career was over, that he came back and that, um, that uh, jackass, who was the general, Curtis LeMay, basically treated him like dirt, uh, wouldn't let him sit down for a cup of coffee, which was the equivalent of a death sentence. He knew he would never be promoted, all, the, all this other good crap. And uh, the next uh, time, the General Tibbets was going to attack Kokura himself with the next atomic bomb. That's how desperate they were. Uh, they were going to send the man in charge of all the uh, um, the 509th bomber group over there to try and attack Kukura. But at any rate, the aviation fuel would have, in their uh, esteemed opinion, these were the men who handled the bomb, went down the records that they thought it was going to blow. And again, um, based on what I've seen, apparently the early atomic bombs would do that. Now, to put this into perspective for the listenership, because the B-29s of that era were World War II era vacuum tube technology, they would not fall out of the sky with an EMP burst. However, 
today's yeah. uh, uh, micro-circuited uh, 777s will all drop from the sky like stones in the event of an EMP. They're not military planes. Military planes are built to ride out, theoretically, a nuclear burst. Uh, civilian planes, there's not a civilian plane in the world that's built to take that, other than conceivably Air Force One or uh, various national equivalents thereof. And that's but, why everybody, um, everybody who can should get a hold of a car that was made uh, perfectly in the 60s because that'll run yes. after something like that. But anybody's car from the, or let's say the mid-70s on, whenever they had a lot of fuel injection, computer control fuel injection, as opposed to manual fuel injection, uh, just it won't work. Right. And that would probably work through um, a bomb that was small enough to be in a satellite. Conceivably, the Americans would not shoot it down because they'd be afraid of releasing radiation. Uh, the a dirty radiation might spread from it. Uh, the same as if, say, the Mir, when it, uh, or Skylab, uh, now I can't remember whether or not Skylab had a nuclear engine. I know all the, all the Russian uh, Mir and all the Russian space uh, uh, stations did. They all had nuclear uh, power plants on them. So whenever any of them fell to Earth, it was essentially a nuclear uh, power plant. Uh, falling to Earth. And uh, I know for a fact that there were some American uh, space uh, projects that were similar. And uh, so... I know one, one happened where it was the um, um, Galileo. They yeah. had a crash in the Jupiter, and some of the theories was that it, was, it would create a nuclear explosion and thus turn on Jupiter, which would have been a very big, bad thing to happen. Yes. Yeah. Well, that that wouldn't. Um, yeah, there were some theories about that, just like there was theories that um, and, and they made mathematical sense that the uh, atomic bomb would start a chain reaction that would not stop and the entire Earth uh, would uh, blow. But mm. the Americans went ahead with the project anyway. Uh, <laughs> there you go. Because, by golly. Yeah. Damn the torpedoes and go on straight ahead there with that. Yes, yes. Well, in all fairness, that's because they knew the uh, the Germans had blown it first and the world had not blown up. So the, uh, y y uh, you know, in all fairness. <laughs> didn't, it didn't stop the uh, people over there in um, uh, with the cyclotron, not cyclotron, the accelerator. Uh, yes, sir. They, they are creating new uh, little black holes and whatnot. Yes, that's right. That's right. Now, everybody might think that all of this is quite esoteric and what the devil has this got to do with North Korea? So we might just cover some of the geopolitics of North Korea. I would, um, as a matter of fact, uh, cover a bit about uh, the, uh, the reason why Korea has impacted America so much. I may have covered this and probably have on James Arthur Yanchik's programs before, but there's no harm in going through it again. Uh, basically, uh, what had happened is we can go into, um, would you want to start with a more recent history with, say, for instance, George Bush Sr. and how that's impacted us? Or do you want to kind of start with the post-Civil War history that led us to the point where we have the tail wagging the dog, and uh, well, the, we did cover uh, the ships that traveled over to that area uh, 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 with male intent. Maybe we can start a little bit newer because I'm thinking that you know this could go on for all afternoon if we don't somehow. But if you right. want to highlight things up to that, that might be advisable uh, rather than go into detail and then go right. into more details. We get closer. Okay. Yeah, and. And uh, so in, in terms of the uh, what, what um, it, the American involvement with Korea did indeed, and I'm going to summarize this as uh, much as uh, I can, uh, and uh, the American involvement started with a conquest of uh, Korea that uh, ultimately – uh, resulted in uh, Korea having an enormous impact on the uh, on, on the American politics, and uh, the reason that this happened was because the Americans basically, uh, when they destabilized the Korean uh, regime, and uh, they started to um, basically set themselves up as an empire overseas. They installed a Caucasian dictator by the name of Durham White Stevens, who I have spoken of at length before. So there's no point in going into uh, too much about him again. And people can look him up and Durham White Stevens when he was assassinated by the Korean uh, people 
uh, two Korean assassins took him out right here in San Francisco in front of the federal building. When he was assassinated, the San Francisco Chronicle and the New York Times both honored him with an obituary that described him as the American dictator of Korea. So uh, he, of course, was uh, basically administering this peninsula, and uh, since the Americans had already had a presence on Korea, we're talking about a presence that was directly um, pretty much after the Civil War, about a decade after the original invasion attempt was directly after the Civil War uh, in 1866. And uh, the um, Americans, of course, wound up so invested in Korea that the Japanese considered them a direct threat. And as I've said before, this would be the equivalent of if the Japanese had invaded Canada and installed a Japanese puppet dictator in Canada, right across the border from the United States. Now, uh, since the, the Americans were also invading the Philippines, which had a direct maritime border with Japan through the island of Taiwan, on which I was born, it would be the equivalent of the Japanese invading Mexico and slaughtering millions of Mexicans. How would the Americans have responded to the Japanese on either side, both in Mexico and in Canada, installing these puppet regimes? Well, if they had any modicum of sanity, uh, they would be criminally negligent if they did not prepare for war. This is, so uh, this exactly. is very important you're saying this stuff, I realize, because as I look into the Durham Stevens uh, who is in Wikipedia, he has been called the first victim of Korean terrorism. <laughs> quote, unquote. So, very different story here in the Wikipedia, so I'm glad that you're actually going through this. Well, uh, you, you know, what's so ironic about that is that uh, I don't think I ever really uh, went into detail about the assassination it, itself. Uh, basically, the leader of the Righteous Army in Korea, as it was known, issued a message to Koreans living abroad, uh, compatriots, we must unite and consecrate ourselves to our land and restore our independence. We must do our best to kill all the barbarian spies and uh, their American masters. And on March 21st of 1908, uh, Durham White Stevens was on a uh, mission of economic maneuvering uh, here in San Francisco. He conducted an interview with San Francisco newspapers. He uh, proclaimed that the Koreans would undergo the same fate uh, that the United States was perpetrating on the Philippines. And the United States, of course, was uh, killing millions of people in the Philippines. Uh, and I'm not exactly this was a genocide which was larger than that that the Turkish people perpetrated against the Armenians in World War I. So we're talking about an enormous genocide. On March 22nd of 1908, uh, Earl Lee was his American name. He was born uh, Yi Il in uh, uh, Korea. He had the same last name as uh, the current leader of North Korea, Kim Jong Il. And uh, basically, he um, was. Uh, so angry uh, about what was going on in his uh, nation, and uh, he was so angry also about what Durham Stevens was threatening to do to it, that he attacked him at San Francisco's Fairmont Hotel. And uh, he was beaten off along with several other Koreans that attacked Durham White Stevens. So on uh, March 23rd of 1908, um, Chang In-wan and Chung myung Un um, were loitering uh, near the San Francisco Ferry Building, and uh, they walked up to Durham Stevens and they shot him with a firearm that was hidden in their arm cast, as if they had broken arms. Now, what makes this so important is that that is exactly the tactic that the Filipino uh, Leon Cholgaz had used to recently kill the president of the United States, uh, Mr. McKinley who he killed with a firearm that was hidden in his hand cast. And uh, when he killed William McKinley in September 11th, 1901, 100 years to the day before the September 11th mm. Twin Tower attacks, then uh, he had avenged, as far as he was concerned, the millions of Filipinos who had been killed by the Americans. Now, these Koreans were imitating, emulating uh, exactly what he had done and uh, so uh, at that time, the San Francisco Chronicle had published uh, three shots. We took three shots to kill Durham White Stevens. Uh, on March 24th of 1908, the San Francisco Chronicle wrote, three shots will be heard around the world, rang out yesterday morning. Fired from the revolver of Chong In-wan, confessed assassin and avowed patriot in Korea. 
Two bullets pierced the body of Durham White Stevens, an American and advisor of the Korean Consul of State. In Korea, the story of the shooting will be heard by a captive people with fanatic praise. And, uh, well, at any rate, uh, he was um, captured. Um, uh, he was uh, basically... You, <laughs> well, the two of them were captured, uh, both of the men that I described. Uh, Chung Moon Un, who was the bandage pistolier, was charged with being an accessory to murder. Um, he was released from prison in June 1908, just a few months later, and fled the country. Chang In Wan uh, was convicted of second-degree manslaughter and sentenced to 25 years at San Quentin. He was paroled after 10 years at the end of World War I. He returned home and was celebrated as a national hero <laughs> by the Korean population in 1918, uh, which is all very bizarre. And you might ask yourself, how did they get away with it? I mean, Leon Cholgaz kills the president, and they put him in the electric chair within hours so that no one will find out he's Filipino, and they claim he was a Polish Bolshevik. And uh, you've got um, anyone else makes these assassination attempts, and they disappear into a deep black hole. Now, these two Koreans essentially got away with it. So we have to ask, what the devil was going on, and what happened? Why was that so exceptional? And... Um, I can't figure it out. <laughs> oh, I thought, well, I thought we were going to hear it. And, uh... the, um, well, I, I can tell you definitely um, that because of their assassination, the uh, military, obviously this was, this was an issue of national security because this man was the American dictator of Korea. The American military was incredibly interested in investigating why the assassination took place, how it took place. And that's how I found out much more about the Leon Cholgaz assassination of President McKinley than I ever did about the Koreans because they were imitating his assassination technique and his assassination technique had been essentially, um, he, he led to the death of a president. So because of that, there was this enormous cover-up to hide the fact that he was Filipino and Catholic because of the American public, they didn't want them to be made aware of the genocide in the Philippines. And uh, as a result, the Americans, who had been brutally honest about committing genocide, suddenly covered it up because it hit home. And so they had to hire the man's ethnicity because then the American people would question the American uh, military's genocidal policies. So uh, as a result, they did all this uh, buying of Polish people literally bought a family out and had them claim that they were all the relatives of Leon Cholgaz. So th this was an entire cover-up that I got to witness because the assassination technique that led to this cover-up was pertinent to the assassination that went on in San Francisco. Now, everything made sense about the assassination. Nothing made sense about what happened to the assassins. And I think it was simply because the Americans uh, wanted everyone to forget about it. And they succeeded. Uh, if those men had been kept in prison uh, or executed, you would probably have heard about it uh, at least vaguely in the sense that we heard about Leon Cholgaz and the assassination of William McKinley. Uh, but because they let them go... Um, you've never heard of Durham White Stevens. No one's heard of Durham White Stevens. <laughs> and uh, the end result was America was able to continue and recommence its dictatorship over Korea after the Second World War when the Japanese essentially stopped the Soviet invasion, pulled out of South Korea. The Americans went back to occupying the southern half of the peninsula. And that's when the tail began to wag the dog. This is what brings us into more recent history. Uh, President George Bush Sr. was, of course, in his own way, um, a fascinating character. He's uh, entirely uh, repulsive, uh, but he did serve time as a, a torpedo pilot in the Second World War. As a matter of fact, he was the youngest torpedo pilot to ever uh, he was the youngest aviator in uh, American history uh, at that point in history that had ever flown a plane. And uh, he basically um, flew um, a torpedo bomber which uh, drops torpedoes to sink ships. Uh, they have a say saying in the Navy that fighter pilots make movies, but torpedo pilots make history. Well, George Bush Jr., excuse me, Sr., never made any history. Uh, he never shot down, he never sank any ships, but he himself was shot down, and he was shot down near a uh, Japanese radar uh, picket island where a radar station was set up, and the Japanese did have radar. And uh, what they um, had 
suffered from was uh, strangulation in terms of logistical supplies by American submarines, which had basically sunk a great deal of Japanese merchant shipping. So as a result, the Japanese were resorting to cannibalizing American prisoners of war. And the way that they would keep the meat fresh would be they'd keep the prisoners alive as long as possible by uh, amputating their limbs first uh, with their samurai swords, eating the limbs, and when they got down to the last limb, then they'd kill the guy and eat the rest of it. So um, if the Americans complain about this, well, you know, I have to say, well, maybe you shouldn't have uh, cut off all the food supplies. You know, there's kind of a logic as to what happens. <laughs> so uh, at any rate, this was the fate that George Bush Sr. was in for. He knew what was going on with captured pilots, and the Japanese were rowing out in a boat to grab him uh, and fatten him up for uh, you know later meals. Uh, the Americans had a submarine uh, dispatched in theater uh, because the Americans were so wealthy, they were able to divert entire submarines and their crews to rescuing downed pilots. Uh, so the submarine surfaced, uh, started machine gunning at the Japanese who uh, paddled away in retreat, and the Americans retrieved uh, George Bush Sr. Now, this is all on footage, and uh, he was filmed being rescued by that submarine. Years later, of course, he was uh, eating dinner with the emperor, uh, at this point, it was the son of Emperor Hirohito, uh, Emperor Heisei, or Emperor Akihito. And uh, right across from him was this Japanese guy who started saying, Hey, we were on that island with the radar station, and we were rolling out to grab you and uh, take you in to the pen. And that's when uh, George Bush Sr. turned around and vomited on the Japanese prime minister's lap. <laughs> was... Yeah, actually, you mentioned it before, and I went and found the video of him doing it. Yes, and uh, yes. there was this um, uh, enough of of his staggering prior to the event around the event that would, they were able to spin that uh, to say he got some kind of a you know, flu or you know something right. Right. So. right. But but uh, in in terms of uh, his other experience <laughs> in Asia. Uh, after the war, um, of course, he became uh, administrator for a short period of time, surprisingly, of the CIA, the Central Intelligence Agency. Well, uh, before um, he had gotten to that point of administering the Central Intelligence Agency, he, of course, was involved with the uh, Central Intelligence Agency as a spook. And uh, at an administrative level, uh, as a bureaucrat, he was sent over to South Korea to set up the CIA branch office. Well, that's essentially what all Korean intelligence is. A lot of people uh, don't realize, uh, because they never think about it, that every single national intelligence agency the world over has an independent name. That goes without saying. Uh, I'm going to uh, mispronounce this terribly for the French, but I believe it's something similar to uh, Duisam Bureau or something of that nature. Of course, the uh, British have M16, M15, uh, MI6, MI5 also. They're, they're, they're sometimes referred to as by ignorant people like myself who always forget. Uh, now, with the Shah, before the fall of the Shah's regime, they had Savak. The Japanese, of course, have Kempe Tai, uh, ISI for the Pakistanis. So you have these different intelligence agencies, but the Korean intelligence agency is simply KCIA, literally Korean CIA. It's like a branch office. So that is how incestuous their occupation has uh, become uh, from the United States. And believe me, the overwhelming majority of the South Korean population is not happy about it. Uh, one of the generals, and you can look this up, uh, one of the high officers of the, uh, basically, the American forces in Korea was stabbed by a Korean. Now, this was in the um, 1990s, uh, so you can look that up and uh, vet what I'm saying. I forget his name to my embarrassment, but that was an undeniable incident they could not cover up. The, um, but the end result is that uh, the Americans are there. They're not necessarily wanted there. Uh, there's nothing they can really do there uh, that's productive other than act as speed bumps if there were a genuine North Korean invasion. 
Uh, but the fact remains that they're really there not as a defense force, but as an occupation force of South Korea. Um, whoever doubts this, to put it into perspective, South Korea has become the Hollywood of Far East Asia. Most other Asian nations, if you take a look at their soap operas, uh, Japan does a lot of its own TV and drama they can afford to. So uh, most Japanese movies and series are Japanese, but they still have a lot of Korean influx in terms of their media. Uh, if you look at Chinese, uh, Taiwanese, many other uh, Far East Asian uh, media uh, dramas, what's on uh, their TV, it will tend to be Korean. Uh, you'll actually hear them in the dubbing uh, in Chinese or Taiwanese dialect. But uh, the reality is you'll take a look at the signs and you'll see, hey, that's Korean lettering. And you'll take a look at the Korean actors and you can say, well, those people are actually Korean. Uh, so uh, Korea has essentially become very much the center point for a lot of Asian entertainment. They were going to wipe the Americans off the market in Asia and the Americans forced the Korean government to make quotas to allow a certain percentage of American films and television series to be forced, programmed into their media schedule. Well, I, I guess Gingham style has showed them, huh? By uh, coming back with the most watched video in history. Oh God! Well, you talk about <laughs> yeah, you talk yeah, yeah, you talk about something similar to Montezuma's Revenge. That's uh -huh. like it's like the Deep South always, uh, you know, got back at the North by giving them lousy presidents. But uh, <laughs> at, at any rate, in, in terms of uh, the Koreans uh, there, of course, people were protesting violently when the Americans were enforcing this because the movies are becoming such a big part of their economy. But, of course, music and movies are basically all America produces today. And uh, if the Koreans were to threaten that in one of the largest markets in the world, uh, the American economy would truly uh, be impacted. So um, with that in mind, the Americans have done their best to control Korea, but it works both ways. Uh, when uh, Bush Sr. was setting up the KCIA, he converted during that period of time to the Church of Reverence on Myung Moon. And I've talked about this before, and uh, I really can't overemphasize how much of an impact Sun Moon Moon has had on America. Basically, people can look up and vet what I'm saying. Bush Sr. has gone on record as saying Reverend Moon is the man with the vision. He said a lot more than that on Asian television. He's gone over there on a pilgrimage once a year, uh, basically kissed the feet of Reverend Sun Myung Moon while he was still alive and said Reverend Moon is the son of God. Now, if you go anywhere in Asia, Taiwan, China, Japan, Korea, you say, hey, what do you think about that George Bush Sr.? Basically, all Asians are going to say, oh, yeah, the Mooney president. But if you talk to any American, of course, um, if you say that, um, they're going to look at you like you're nuts. I, I'll be Nobody honest knows. with you. I mean, I'm, you know, I'm not information guru here, but uh, the first time you said that to me, I mean, the time you said it, it's the first time I've ever heard that in my life. I, I have yeah. no clue. Yeah, no. I, well, I, I believe you. And uh, the point is that there are photos uh, that people should be able to access on the net because I've seen them printed in American newspapers of uh, George Bush Sr. where he was with um, basically Mooney girls. Uh, that's his fetish. He loves to have sex with young Japanese converts to the Reverend Moon Church. That is his thing, probably his way of getting back at uh, his horrible experience with almost being eaten by the Japanese in World War II. I'm sure there's some kind of sick, perverted twist there uh, in that regard. But at any rate, um, what happened was that uh, Reverend Moon came over to the United States and he bought the Washington Post. He spent something like literally $20 million over time on the Washington Post. And through that, he was able to get Bush Sr. elected. Bush Sr. was running against Dukakis. And when uh, Reverend uh, Moon, through the Washington Post, started the rumor that the candidate Dukakis was seeing a psychiatrist, which he was not, uh, Dukakis, of course, fell out of favor and George Bush Sr. was elected. Now, this is how decisive Reverend Moon was in making Bush Sr. president. No wonder Reverend Moon is considered God by George Bush Sr. Well, you know, long before uh, that period of time, in 1975, there was what was called the Young Ladies Campaign, where according to the FBI, uh, they issued a formal report saying that Reverend Moon dispatched 300 pretty young Asian girls to 
uh, infiltrate the U.S. congressional staffs. And they managed to compromise uh, hundreds of congressmen and basically pretty much to the point where they were able to lobby for whatever they wanted. So we're talking about an enormous influence. They're electing presidents. They're uh, lobbying in Congress. Uh, they are basically controlling the United States. And uh, so we've got a situation where they could also uh, basically um, change the politics in such a way that um, it was noticed by the U.S. House Committee. In the 1970s, there was what was called Korea Gate, And a U.S. House Committee headed by Representative Donald Fraser found that Reverend Moon and South Korean intelligence agencies were illegally influencing U.S. Congress through their Young Ladies campaign. So what happened? In return, uh, basically, the, um, in 1978, Reverend Moon sa sabotaged Congressman Fraser's bid for the U.S. Senate by spending millions and spreading the rumor that Fraser was a communist. And Fraser lost the primary election. And five days after that election, Fraser's house was burned to the ground. Mm. Uh, so uh, we're, we're talking about, oh, by the way, I was wrong in my numbers when uh, I, I recall now, uh, looking through my notes, uh, Reverend Moon spent over $3 billion on the Washington Times, uh, which he founded. And he also bought the Washington Post, by the way, which he had spent the $20 million on that I, spoke, that I spoke of. So he basically had two major rags with which he was influencing American media. And uh, when he got uh, Reverend, excuse me, uh, President Bush Sr. elected, President Bush Sr. apparently took to worshiping him. And uh, because of uh, Bush Sr.'s affinity for young Japanese girls who had converted over to the Mooney cult, he actually went down to uh, South America and opened up Reverend Moon's version of a Jonestown. It was this huge indoctrination camp, which was so isolated in the Amazon that nobody's family or private detectives could come to rescue these people who were taken down there uh, to be indoctrinated. So uh, our president opened that up, and there were photos of him doing so even in American newspapers. I don't know if they're still available on the net, but they were certainly uh, quite readily available all over Asia. And everybody knew what he was doing in Asia. Uh, Americans only got a whiff of it, and nobody paid attention to it. And this is part of, if you talk about conspiracy, here you've got a president who's uh, a, major, uh, a member of a foreign religious cult. He is doing everything that everyone feared President Kennedy would be doing as a Catholic. In other words, everybody was scared to death in a Protestant, uh, predominantly Protestant majority nation, the United States, that a Ca Irish Catholic president would be obeying the rules of the Pope. And many people still accused at that time, nobody does so anymore, but at the time that Kennedy was president, his involvement in the Vietnam War, which he may have been trying to uh, get out of, but more than likely really not as aggressively as uh, Oliver Stone portrays him, because he and his brother, uh, um, Bobby, almost undoubtedly were involved in the assassination of the Vietnamese president, Diem, who was extremely corrupt. And they were trying to uh, basically reconstruct the Vietnamese regime forcibly from a corrupt dictatorship into a democracy. And uh, Well, I want to mention about uh, going back about Kennedy. I remember as a kid, now, I, I'm in like first grade when he was shot, okay? Yeah. But I remember when people worried about uh, being him being voted in because we'd have to go to school on Saturday right. because the Catholics go to school on Saturday. And yet here I am, an adult, and I never heard about George Bush and the Moonies. Now, again, I don't comb the newspaper religiously, but I'm looking now, even now, looking on the web as you're talking, and yeah. there's very dubious apolog apologetics uh, for him. Oh, no, he just uh, he just knew him, and that was no big deal. And then you get the, quote, conspiracy theorists are the ones pointing out the issues that you are. Uh, right. So it's, it's even to this day, uh, it's still uh, played down. Oh, yeah. That's, and, and it certainly was never taken advantage of by the Democrats, which really ought to tell you something. Yeah, well, see, <laughs> when, when you hear this stuff, then, you know, you know that it's, it's been a game for quite a long time. Yes. Yeah, definitely. And uh, so my point is to the listenership, think about what I'm saying. You have a uh, president who is doing exactly what people were fearing that Kennedy would do. And people were accusing him of waging war in Vietnam 
because it was, believe it or not, a lot of people don't understand this, Vietnam used to be a French colony. It was, of course, French Indochina. I mm -hmm. know, of course, that you are painfully aware of this. And, of course, the French are Catholic. And there were many nuns and priests who uh, ran the schools in Vietnam. The ruling family, uh, if you remember, the Dragon Lady and several other, uh, Madame Nu and several of the other uh, um, uh, dynasties that were um, corruptly running the Republic of South Vietnam, were because of their... Uh, involvement with the French were Catholic. They were Catholicized. So uh, the people were assuming that Kennedy was involved in Vietnam to protect Catholic interests. Now, no one today remembers that perspective. That was the normal perspective in the United States uh, before Kennedy was shot. And uh, they were all saying, oh, he's obeying the Pope. We're over there to defend the Catholic regime, to save a Catholic regime from falling. Now, who on earth today remembers that? <laughs> and uh, my point is, mm. here you have Bush, and he's uh, involved with uh, doing what a cult leader in uh, Co South Korea is telling him to do. Nobody remembers it. To put this into perspective for you even some more, because South Korea is legally at war with North Korea, by law, all industries must manufacture weapons. All industries must be involved in defense. Now, because the Reverend Moon Church is incorporated, it is the only religious church in the world that manufactures its own weapons. So it has an industrial base and manufactures armaments. Now, who are It also would explain born? why the Bushes, I believe the daughters, uh, Bush Jr.'s daughters, technically, bought land in uh, Ecuador, I think it was, which was adjoining Reverend Sung Young Moon's huge uh, estate. Uh, not estate, yes. but like landmass. I mean, he owns a huge amount of the land there. Yeah, I mean, a state doesn't do it justice. Uh, yeah. Basically, shall we say, his state within a state. <laughs> so, um, yeah, it's, a, it's, a, it's an incredible involvement. So when I hope that puts it into perspective for the American public, why America might literally go to war for South Korea in, and in, in what otherwise really wouldn't make any sense. Uh, now, the Japanese Paraguay. could defend uh, themselves. Oh, I'm sorry? I was Paraguay. I'm just... Uh, oh, Paraguay. Uh, Thank you. Paraguay. Paraguay. Yes. Yeah, Paraguay. Yes. And as a matter of fact, um, yes. And it, it, considering what I said about the Amazon, there's been an enormous, uh, of course, um, penetration of Reverend Moon into uh, South America uh, Latin America and uh, and uh, as well as North America, basically into the uh, Western Hemisphere. Um, we're, we're talking about truly South Korea has had an impact on America that people have not acknowledged. Let us reemphasize North Korea's impact on America with its counterfeiting, because that, of course, has uh, done a lot to eviscerate America's economy. Now, you've got these two Koreas that are at war with each other. They are not conspiring, I assure you, to take down the U.S., but functionally, uh, while they're at each other's throats, while they're still legally at war with each other, both of them have done a great job of taking the United States down by several pegs. <laughs> And that's incredible. When you think about that, who the hell knows in the United States the enormous impact that the Korean Peninsula has had on American history? I, I there. Uh, I can't hear you, by the way. No, oh, I'm here. I was uh, dealing with something. Oh, okay. Uh, yes. Being a live thing here, there's real time issues going around here. Uh, a neighborhood it was a neighborhood issue, and I had to uh, interact oh. in it. So. Understood. I'm, I'm sorry, sorry. I yes. Comment on the last. Uh, oh, item. understood. Uh, oh, by the way, the the neighborhood issue he's talking about is he's got a peeping tom running around that just has it uh, <laughs> just has the hots for him. That uh, no, uh, not, it's not actually anywhere near that. But uh, would that be that would be the trouble I was in? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> not that I would invite such things. Uh, uh, unlike Raymond Burr, perhaps, uh, or other people. <laughs> I, uh, uh, 
Well, good, sir. Uh, I, I think we've covered quite a, a bit about the uh, Korean Peninsula that has uh, put it into perspective. Uh, do you want to cover, in a sense, what could happen? Uh, like I went on to with yeah. my other show. If, if yeah, and actually, I'm, I'm glad. I'm glad you brought up the uh, whole thing with Sung Wang Moon because when you bring up these issues, even of course the dictator and all this stuff, you bring up these. You could see this this connection and the steps which have not been in the minds of the American uh, people, at least uh, from my experience. And then you bring Moon into it and how much influence and what he controls behind it, you have this uh, this weird kind of uh, situation where you have the United States, yet again, in being boss, ends up being somewhat of a slave, uh, at least the peop American people, that is. And uh, when people say, well, hey, you know, that guy's crazy, North Korea, he's going to do all this stuff. Well, it's not like he's been uh, treated well by the United States and their cohorts uh, or their land has or history has and this is coming out of left field there is a uh, background behind it and when you one does hear the background it, I mean it doesn't mean it's okay but you can understand that it's not a one way out of left field how can he do this he's crazy well there's we've had some um, we being meaning the United States uh, has had some uh, hand in this evolutionary process, what I say? And you talked earlier about uh, the uh, drought over there being manufactured by perhaps Harp and other things, and I was looking into that as well, that uh, it's kind of odd that there's a drought in North Korea yeah. alone. <laughs> I mean, yes. like, right there. It's like yes. someone putting a flashlight, so to speak, uh, on North Korea and making it uh, uh, not work, and so now you do have the... Uh, the possibility. I mean, Harp has acknowledged in its patents issues about that. Uh, uh, yes. You know, so on. So you have that in the background. I don't know if you could address that a little bit as another pre precipitant of uh, the the latest events that are happening. Well, I, I think that um, because I went into it before was not that I was avoiding it. I'm happy to go into yeah, no, it I mean, again. Just a little quick kind of bring it to yeah. mind here for this uh, little right. salad we're putting together. That's right. And uh, what what happened with HARP when I was sent into uh, by the U.S. government, the Department of Defense, into Sonoma State University to infiltrate Project Censored? At that time, HARP, as we know it today, actually did not exist. It was on the drawing tables. It was conceptual. And what the DOD was trying to find out was how much of that concept was leaking or hemorrhaging through the DOD into the uh, public through uh, a lot of gung-ho journalism students uh, that uh, were at Project Censored. And Project Censored uh, is Sonoma State University. It is an ongoing project that is funded by John McLaughlin of the McLaughlin Group, uh, Ted Koppel, another, uh, other big names in the uh, media. And uh, it takes young journalism students and asks them to uh, push themselves into investigating underreported stories. Now, all of these underreported stories are ultimately uh, reported uh, in Nexus Magazine, uh, which is, uh, as far as I know, the only uh, source of media that publishes the results of their investigations. And they do so every semester. And so uh, what Nexus Magazine is, of course, the magazine that interviewed me uh, concerning the uh, Third Reich in exile. And uh, Nexus Magazine, of course, is not allowed to circulate in the United States. A lot of people don't realize that it is an English magazine. It is uh, published and edited in Australia by Duncan Rhodes. Um, and it um, has uh, been around forever. Um, but uh, any attempt to establish themselves in circulation in the United States is immediately uh, shut down upon. Uh, the United States claims it's because they have alternative health commercials, which uh, violate um, the regulations of the FDA. Um, but uh, the reality is they don't want you um, hearing what the people at Project Censored uh, identify. And uh, one of the things they identified it, through Project Censored at the time that I was there was that an enormous amount of land was uh, – being purchased in Gakona, Alaska. And what they were setting up, of course, was a facility where they were trying to develop 
Tesla technology and Montauk technology, which had been around for quite some time, specifically to the point where they could uh, reverse the jet stream. And we've gone into before, of course, the incredible uh, decisive impact that the jet stream has had on World War II and therefore on American history. And uh, the result was that the Americans wanted some way to reverse that. They ultimately accomplished that with HARP. Uh, but after HARP was utilized to accomplish that task, since we were not actively at war with Japan, we began to use it on a nation state that we were still actively at war with. Now, it's important to emphasize that America was never legally at war with North Korea. America, the United States, uh, remains uh, participating as a United Nations peacekeeper. Um, again, uh, since I brought that up, it's important to emphasize the fact that any American man who dies on the Korean Peninsula, and there are plenty that do, uh, certainly those that died during the 1950 to 1953 period of proactive prosecution of hostilities, when they find their bodies to this day that are left on the Korean Peninsula, they send them home to the United States in coffins that are draped under the United Nations flag. They are counted as United Nations fatalities. They are not counted as American servicemen. Now, I hope that puts that into perspective for our American listenership. Beyond that, the Americans who have been injured or killed since that point are still counted as United Nations casualties if they're injured or fatalities if they're killed, such as in border skirmishes, maritime skirmishes between the U.S. Navy and the Korean Navy. Now, all of this has resulted in Americans not even knowing that anyone has died on the Korean Peninsula. This is why Korea is known as the Forgotten War. So when people hear about Vietnam, and I talk about how grossly we've under-numbered uh, the names that are on the wall, think about the Korean War for which there is not even a wall. And I often emphasize that it's a distant relative of mine, Maya Ying Lin, whose family name is the same as mine in Chinese, Lin, and she, of course, designed the uh, wall, the Vietnam Memorial Wall. She paid for it terribly uh, at, at the time and is still, in a sense, paying for the repercussions of designing that wall. That's an entirely different story of dealing with the Vietnam War and America's yeah, actually, post-war. Actually, let me uh, – I wonder why when the Vietnam War – uh, veterans came back, they were shunned from being involved in veteran activities, claiming it wasn't a war, and yet there was no problem with the Korean veterans. Was it because there was a word? I mean, that they, people thought it was a war? I mean, why, what made the Korean and American veterans different? Uh, I, I think, well, for one thing, uh, to show you how much alike they are, the Korean veterans have suffered from poisoning from Agent Orange, just as the Vietnam veterans have. Mm -hmm. uh, it's never acknowledged. Uh, when the VA, Veterans Administration, was forced to acknowledge the reality of Agent Orange, they had to perforce uh, treat all veterans who suffered from the effects of Agent Orange. If they had the symptoms that they were suffering from Agent Orange damage, the VA ultimately had to pay for their treatment. That included dishonorable discharges, of which there were plenty during the Vietnam War. So uh, that almost broke the VA. That, that almost broke the VA budget. The Korean War veterans who um, suffer from Agent Orange exposure received no such treatment. Uh, so that shows you how bizarre that is. Bureaucratically, there is far less recognition uh, than you would think of the Korean War. With Americans, I don't think it was so much that the Korean War veterans were accepted. I think it was simply the fact that no one really even knew there was a war. Uh, quite literally, most American veterans who came home from Korea, um, people just thought they were over there like on a vacation. I mean, it's that bad. It really is that bad. If you talk to Korean War veterans, there are many who will verify what I'm saying, that they would come home and say, I just got back from Korea where they had suffered from mass human wave attacks from the Chinese forces. And uh, they would try to tell people about this and they'd say, shut up, I'm watching I Love Lucy, the new episode is on. I mean, I've literally heard Korean War veterans say this, that uh, people were just in denial. It was like some bizarre, they came home and it was like an alternate universe as opposed to Vietnam. Well, when, nothing when, was hit. When did it quote unquote end? 
Well, uh, um, of course, we all know that uh, the reality is it has never ended. Never Vietnam, ended. Right. excuse me, uh, North and South Korea are still legally at war. Uh, the Pan Moon John peace talks are ongoing to this day. This is why I find it so incredible that when I describe the Japanese American War, which comparatively speaking was much uh, larger in its dimensions, that it took till 1952 to end per the United States government's own admission. Uh, and yet people find this so hard to believe or understand, and yet we've still got this Korean War, which is still ongoing. Now, North Korea and South Korea are at war. The uh, Americans are participating as a United Nations yeah, I mean that, belligerent. That, I mean, that explains why I'm trying to find, uh, you know, the uh, beginning ending, and there really isn't. Right. I mean, even in, yes. even in a Wikipedia uh uh, you know, propaganda approach. They, I mean, they're still not even saying that it ended. There was these various uh, events that took place, and uh, you know, they're kind of looking at it being November fifty four. But I'll be frank with you: the most I've uh, references to Vietnam, uh, Korea were ever, were in Mash. You know, yeah. the show Mash, <laughs> where the, yes, it was the no, biggest uh, right. footprint about Korean it War on TV. I think. Yes, if it were not for Alan Alda, um, then we would probably not remember the Korean War at all, quite honestly. I mean, it's tragic. And uh, it is called the Forgotten War for a reason, but one of the reasons why was because it impacts us to this day in such a way where we've got Korean cult leaders who are essentially, were running the American empire, certainly during the administration of George Bush Sr. And remember that George Bush Sr.'s administration uh, in reality lasted a good, uh, oh, as long as Franklin Delano Roosevelt's, because while uh, Ronald Reagan was president, it was George Bush Sr. who was truly uh, running the show. Uh, of that, I, I would lay my soul on the altar uh, to back up that statement. And uh, because Ronald Reagan was recorded as having suffered from uh, Alzheimer's symptoms uh, well uh, before he even became president. So uh, in terms of uh, the HARP scenario, um, uh, the reality of HARP, what we had was they established uh, this technology. Uh, HARP's acronym, of course, is uh, truly not what people think it is. They think of H-A-A-R-P. The real acronym is H-A cubed R squared P squared, which stands for High Frequency Activated Auroral Atmospheric Resonance Research Projection Program. And the uh, aspect of HARP, which worked to turn the jet stream, was later on utilized in a much more quiet function uh, as passive offense. And by passive offense, what I mean is that the electromagnetic pulsations of HARP were such that it passively defends itself because the North Koreans have consistently tried to take it out with Scud missile attacks. Uh, crab uh, fishermen, uh, the kind that are filmed on uh, the world's most dangerous job, uh, will tell you that uh, oftentimes in their nets, um, they will catch um, busted up bits of uh, Scud missiles along the Alaskan coast where the North Koreans have launched Scuds whose primitive electronic brains are scrambled by the natural, uh, if you could call it that, resonant uh, electromagnetic pulsation, uh, which regularly emits from the HARP facility. This means that the thing is going all the time on a fairly passive level and uh, is pretty much like a giant cell phone uh, irradiating uh, a good deal of the population of Alaska and the Yukon. Now, uh, the reason that it does that is because it's passively defending itself from North Korean attacks because it itself is attacking North Korea through a relay, a daisy chain, of very low orbital satellites that are uh, often mistaken for uh, low on the horizon stars. And these satellites in turn are operating in conjunction with very high flying, uh, essentially geosynchronous orbital dirigibles. These are unmanned and they're highly polished, highly uh, mirror-like, and I have uh, images of these in my DVD, Satan's Crusaders. And uh, so I do want to avail 
the public of that, and we'll speak of that in a little bit. Uh, we'll make the pitch for that DVD, which has a photograph of one of those low-hanging satellites, highly polished to a mirror finish. And what this daisy chain of satellites and uh, dirigibles does is it sends electromagnetic frequency uh, elf from the HARP facility to the North Korean area, which used to be the breadbasket of Northeast Asia. Uh, they were an agrarian, collectivized communist society that if they had united with industrial South Korea back in the day, before they experienced this never-ending drought, they would have become a superpower to rival Japan. No question about it. Uh, the Korean Peninsula is quite large, just as the Japanese archipelago is quite large. And uh, the, with that industry and food, um, they would neither one of them would have been as dependent on external sources as both of them are for their sustenance today. Now, uh, the Americans leached all of the electrolytes and uh, minerals out of the soil content of North Korea through this electromagnetic uh, frequency assault. This is entirely uh, proven because the Soviets used to grow or stimulate the growth of their uh, agriculture and vegetables through electromagnetic uh, stimulation. They used to like send pulses through the ground to stimulate growth. The reverse of that is easily doable. It is always easier to destroy than it is to construct. And the Americans have managed to do that. And they have created an entirely unnatural, situated drought condition for well over a decade, more like a decade and a half, which has led to the deaths of millions of people and cannibalism in North Korea. So we have a horrible situation where, yes, the Americans have done horrible things to the Korean people. They are responsible for genocide. The North Korean government is unfortunately a decadent communist dynasty that takes an enormous amount of its benefits from counterfeiting American money to indulge themselves as opposed to feeding their people. But conceivably, not all the money in the world could do that at this point. So we have a situation where maybe, conceivably, the North Koreans are going to want to strike back at the U.S. Now, none of this would make logical sense because the entire lifestyle of the decadent, pampered communist dynasty in Pyongyang uh, exists parasitically off of the American economy. If they were to wipe out the American population, that, of course, destroys any economic basis for their luxurious lifestyle. Now, why would they do that? Well, just because it's totally illogical doesn't mean it's not going to happen. Uh, World War I was totally illogical, and yet it happened. Uh, there is no sane reason why World War I occurred. Uh, but occur it did, and everything that resulted from World War I was far more catastrophic than anything that occurred in World War II. So um, the same could happen with the Korean Peninsula, where we um, have a catastrophic result for the world uh, with the electromagnetic pulsing of the United States if the North Koreans feel that they're being pushed too far, if the dynasty feels it's being pushed too far. It's all up to the people of the dynasty that rules North Korea. The North Korean people are simply a religious cult uh, based on a single personality that happens to have natural national boundaries and a and a very strong military so um it's a bizarre situation um again to put something into perspective for you as to what the north korean dynasty does you can look this up uh the original kim jong-il um who well the father of the current uh ill uh basically uh wanted um to establish his own series of North Korean Godzilla films to rival the Japanese Gojira. So he abducted the most beautiful actress in South Korea and the most famous director in South Korea who uh, had won several awards, uh, was recognized internationally. He abducted both of them and uh, forced them to uh, direct and star in a North Korean uh, kaiju, meaning giant strange beast. Daikaiju means uh, great strange mysterious beast in Japanese. He made them star in a North Korean Daikaiju film titled Polgaseri. Yeah, it was just, I just which, found it. I just found okay, it. Okay, there yeah. you go. Yeah, 
and uh, in their version, of course, has giant horns, uh, looks very uh, much like a reptilian bipedal ox. And uh, so this is kind of like the, um, the, the strangeness, the bizarre aspect of uh, the North Korean regime and what the dynasty is willing to go through. And uh, that was like part of a series of their own uh, Daikaiju films. So uh, uh, they never made one yet where Pogasari versus Gojira, but um, – you know, perhaps uh, the new uh, Korean leader will indulge in that. It depends on what kind of. I don't know if he's like his father. Uh, he seems an affable enough fellow. Maybe he's worse. <laughs> uh, it's uh, it's very difficult to tell. Uh, the he invited Dennis Rodman over, and uh, uh, that alone shows that he's nuts. Uh, the um, uh, so. I, I, I really don't know what to say beyond what I have other than to go into lurid detail as what to what the electromagnetic pulse could do to the United States. One thing I forgot to mention on my own program was I certainly mentioned, of course, the um, because of the electrical power that's required to pump water, I certainly went into detail uh, or at least a bit of detail about what would happen to the subway system in New York. The tunnel system would, of course, um, flood immediately because there would be no uh, water pumping uh, efforts. Well, actually, before uh, you do that, I mean, do you think it's po- uh, I mean, incredibly possible that this possibly could happen and that this, this satellite may have a pulse device? Uh, and that's what it was intended for. Uh, I mean, that's a, a credible possibility. Well, the fact that the two Korean submarines uh, kind of went off sonar uh, while this went into orbit, uh, it's it uh, looks like it's the it looks like they're holding that there as their ace in the hole. Um, it really is. I think they're really trying to force the United States into some acquisitions. Maybe they want the United States to turn Harp off. So maybe they're trying to force the United States finally uh, to alleviate the drought situation. This is a new leader. Maybe he's totally different from his father. Maybe his father was willing to have the people uh, suffer to the point where they were cannibalizing each other while he indulged himself uh, in Lakers games. Uh, the, the dynasty is a dynasty of Lakers fans. The um, And uh, video games, etc. Um, they... <laughs> But in terms of uh, what they were doing with um, with now, uh, maybe it's come to the point where he's facing a revolution if he doesn't do something. Maybe he's facing a revolution from the population or, a, more plausibly, a junta from the military if he does not start feeding the people. So in order to do that, he's going to have to have the Americans turn off harp. Maybe now he's being pushed to the point where he has to push the Americans to do so. So maybe we've finally been brought by the madmen who run our nation to a genuine uh, moment of truth where we are facing the ultimate brinkmanship. So the two subs with the satellite in the sky, maybe the EMP burst, would be bad enough to take out, say, three of them were rinky-dink and produced EMP pulses that were fairly small. That would still take out together, the three of them, uh, 50% of the grid, almost certainly, which would knock out the rest automatically anyway because of the um, overload on the rest of the grid system. So the grid system in America is so old and it hasn't been renovated in well over half a century. Actually, I can stop there and attest this. My brother, who uh, is a uh, lineman, yeah. would go on and on and say that how bad this stuff is. My dad was one, and at the time they used to spend a lot of time changing out equipment. Nothing was wrong with it. It just reached its time to change. Well, now they leave yeah. it up there till it fails, and it's so bad that he says one of these days you're going to get a few hundred degree days in a row and it's just going to start a chain reaction and have it all just burn down. In Chicago area, so. Oh yeah, there's well, an insider uh, type of a uh, commentary on it. Oh yes, and and well taken. Uh, Chicago is still suffering economically some effects from the Great Chicago Fire, uh, so I can easily imagine the uh, impact that a new catastrophe would have on uh, the second city as well as on New York City and all the rest of them. I went into lurid detail on uh, the my own uh, radio show, which people can look up on YouTube, but it's important to emphasize one of the details I forgot to cover was that I covered things like, you know, 
the the pumping of the water in New York City, et cetera. And I also covered just uh, plumbing. When you don't have electricity to make the plumbing work, you can imagine what it's like in a building like I grew up in the Tenderloin. And there's inner city ghettos all over the United States that are seething with people. And uh, in my case, I was in the largest building in the San Francisco ghetto, uh, the Tenderloin ghetto of San Francisco, the mo- one of the most dangerous ghettos in the world, I can assure you. And uh, I lived in uh, one of the biggest buildings there that was called The Compound. And it was El Cerrito Apartments was its genuine name. And it had 100 units. Now, imagine living in a 100-unit building in the center of a ghetto where suddenly the water's off, the plumbing doesn't work, uh, there's no electricity. And, of course, the entire city is going to become uninhabitable within 24 hours. Uh, and these people will migrate out and uh, gang members will use the weapons that they have to start hunting for food. You're going to have people killing cows on people's uh, ranches with AK-47s. Now, the good news is they're going to have to walk miles and miles to do it because there's going to be no way to pump gas. All of the fuel is going to be stuck because the pumping stations won't be able to get anything out without electricity. So you're left with the movie, essentially, um, The Postman, (laughs) everybody on horseback. Now, uh, for all its flaws, it was a horrible film. It was unwatchable, and it had an extremely uh, purposefully, uh, masochistically anticlimactic ending. Uh, Everyone's looking for a fight, and, of course, they don't get it. Uh, But the reality is that other than that, the film was quite plausible in how it portrayed a um, post-EMP future. Is basically uh, we've got people riding around on horseback and nobody uh, is using cars to any extent because fuel is almost inaccessible. Uh, So there you have it. I mean, that's where we're going to uh, be if there is an EMP burst. So um, now, again... Keep in mind what I said. Logically, it should not happen because uh, North Korea is a parasite. Uh, It doesn't want to kill the host or shouldn't want to kill the host. But what if its host is killing it and therefore it has to kill the host in self-defense? If it's going to go, it takes the host out too. I mean. Right. I mean, you know, it's when you use the word parasite, uh, the actual parasites aren't real deep thinkers and they react uh, to uh, their vital around them. And I would say that the. Uh, people in our government are a parasite on the people, which could actually crash the economy, for example. And I don't think the people who are parasites are that adept at keeping their host alive, especially when it gets you know out of control, which is happening over there with the, the terrible drought they're having. Yes, and, and has been happening for quite some time. And, and North Korea, make no mistake about it, is a terrible regime. Uh, people are sentenced for generations to labor camps. If someone is accused of political uh, dissidence, if someone is accused of, tr- accused of treason, subversion, or disloyalty, uh, they sentence not only the individual guilty, but the next two or three generations. So you have children uh, born into labor camps whose only life they have known uh, from birth to death is slaving away in the mines uh, digging up uranium for the building of atomic bombs in uh, the Korean Peninsula. There are people who live like that. They have nothing to eat other than each other. As prisoners die, uh, the guards uh, literally uh, gut them and cook them and feed them to the other inmates. And uh, there is, as I brought up before, other than that, the cattle, which they're not allowed to eat. The cattle are too valuable to eat. And uh, so they dig through the fecal matter of the cattle for grains that they can devour. I'm not kidding. I'm not exaggerating. This is the horror of the North Korean regime. One of China's biggest problems is illegal immigration from North Korea into communist China, which is considered like a uh, the way Mexicans would consider America back in the heyday of the 80s, like a land of milk and honey. Uh, so that really ought to tell you something. And uh, so uh, you have an enormous North Korean population in uh, Manchuria that the Chinese can do nothing to stop. And uh, so uh, let's get this straight. Uh, North Korea is not a puppet of communist China. No one controls North Korea. North Korea invaded the Seychelles Islands in the 1980s. People can vet this. They can look this up. 
No one was able to stop them. The United States tried to react with a plausible deniability operation using one of the most famous mercenaries in the world, the celebrity mercenary Mad Mike Hoare, last name spelled H-O-A-R-E. So Mad Mike Hoare uh, organized a bunch of mercenaries. They pretended they were a soccer team. They went to the Seychelles Islands. Uh, Seychelles is spelled uh, S-E-Y-C-H-E-L-L-E-S. Uh, on a plane, on a civilian plane that was loaded in its belly with a bunch of weapons they were going to take out, and they were going to try and take out the uh, North Korean advisory regime that was occupying the Seychelles Islands and turn them communists. And uh, they failed miserably because their cover was blown. Uh, they were arrested as soon as they landed. And Mad Mike Hoare, I believe, spent the next decade in jail. Um, so that is the kind of uh, situation where you've got North Korea invading a group of islands in the Indian Ocean off the coast of Africa, and nobody even knows about it. And the Americans respond with a mercenary operation that goes wrong. They hide it. They cover it up. Uh, the American public never knew about it. And uh, you have to ask yourself, what were the North Koreans doing there? And again, uh, it's very difficult to fathom. I would assume probably uh, using it as a strategic choke point from which to interdict drugs and also to buy diamonds out of South Africa, which they were probably putting on the world market uh, in some fashion. I, I think that uh, the um, North Korean dynasty uh, is very smart about money in terms of exploiting, exploiting it and finding new investments. So um, let, me, we definitely let, me, let me hop in. I, one of the things I found fascinating was that when the uh, North Koreans announced they had a tried uh, successful nuclear detonation. Uh, the uh, surrounding uh, governments denied. So, well, we think it's a lot of TNT. We think they put because the you know the signature in the ground wasn't good enough. We don't think they can actually light one up and this and that. Now all of a sudden, oh, they've done it. They can hit uh, California with it. And you know they're they're they went from denying it could do it to now exaggerating what they can do. Uh, so to me, there's some uh, political. Uh, Tom Foolery chicanery going on with with this using this, and so if I could, uh, we got about forty minutes I think left or less than that because I don't want to go too much longer over three because I frankly I have a program to turn off. Uh, nice. But the, I mean, so we already decided you already we just, you you're saying that the pulse is possible that they yeah. can definitely develop to deliver a nuclear device, albeit World War Two ish in nature, and it but it could hit Japan, it could hit. Uh, South Korea is that is that true? Yeah, oh, absolutely. But the the point is that uh, it might hit Japan, or the Japanese might be able to interdict it with, uh, or the Japanese would certainly be able to retaliate. Uh, the Japanese well, yeah, retaliation is obvious. But I'm talking about you know you know could because back in the uh, the Gulf War days when uh, Saddam Hussein was throwing scuds at Israel, you had these right. Patriot missiles which are supposed to be able to blow it up in the air and all that. Now, given the electronic pulse as aspects of it, uh, you know, would there be any defense if they decide to launch other than it not working? Is there any defense to it? Well, it's the Japanese uh, camera technologies that are in the warheads of uh, the American uh, anti-ballistic missiles. Uh, that uh, So we basically have uh, the Japanese more than capable of technologically defending themselves or at least giving a good run at it if they had a fair warning as to an incoming missile. Uh, North Korea is very close, though. So um, it's, it's, again, just a toss-up. It depends on how much of uh, an alert that Japan's defense are on how and uh, but the end result is I'm confident that the um, Japanese uh, yeah I, I've always been had a tough love attitude towards the Japanese the Japanese have had such a um, easy life uh, since the um, victory in World War II and uh, it certainly was a victory there's no way anyone can deny that with their quality of life that they've had since then uh, but uh, the point is that they've been so spoiled that they are truly decadent, and um, it disgusts me, quite frankly. So Fukushima Daiichi was probably a step in a very strange sense, in this sense, in the right direction to force them to start um, really analyzing some hard realities about the challenges of life in a dangerous environment. Uh, uh, North Korea um, 
going literally ballistic would force them to do so even more. Uh, so I see nothing but good coming from it, really, in the long run, uh, in terms of uh, getting uh, the Japanese to become uh, basically what they were uh, before this period of uh, unparalleled luxury. And uh, But in terms of the uh, missiles, always remember, the missiles really are not what North Korea would use to attack the United States, per se. They right. would launch missiles in a vertical launch to deliver an EMP. You would have to. To deliver an EMP, you've got to get it high up in the atmosphere. But the vertical launch would be conducted from converted barges or merchant ships off the coast or those submarines. That's what is uh, amazing oh, to me. I see. Yeah, and, and a vertical launch would be also the satellite, which would not lead, need a vertical launch. Uh, the satellite would be in a position where the um, electrons would just drop from the satellite burst like gravel in an avalanche. They mm -hmm. would drop and they would run across all of the wires that were available to them, which are, of course, strung up over every major city. Um, we had a solar flare in the 1800s that um, was studied by a solar astronomer by the name of Richard Compton, C-O-M-P-D-E-N. Richard Compton ultimately gave his name to the phenomena. It's called the Compton effect. And the solar flares of the time were so powerful that they took out the Victorian era uh, infonet grid of that time, which was telegraphy. Now we're talking about extremely over-engineered symptom, si excuse me, systems, where you had um, very heavy cables uh, and people were electrocuted, who were uh, literally wireless operators. When that solar flare took place, uh, many people were electrocuted to death. Also, it ran along uh, railroad uh, lines and uh, basically created all kinds of damage to the infrastructure. Fused boxes shut, uh, took out the grid of the day, as I said, um, uh, set, uh, set all kinds of uh, buildings on fire. Uh, because of short-circuiting so many grids. So that was um, just a hint of what the Compton effect will have on a high-tech society. Now, combine that with the fact that you had incidents like uh, the Soviet test called Starfish Prime, which people can search engine, and Starfish Prime was an enormous uh, kiloton airburst conducted by the Soviets in 1962, I believe, that uh, took out overbuilt Soviet-era automobiles that were not the electronic dandies we have today that would, uh, of course, die instantly while in motion with, under an EMP. But these cars were fused uh, in such a way that they died, got, um, got uh, shall we say, um, blown away uh, in terms of their use. They uh, were unusable due to Starfish Prime. Starfish Prime also affected uh, lines, ran across lines, and burned out um, facilities 400 miles away. Uh, so an EMP can have monstrous effects just collaterally. Uh, so um, sure, it could be a fizzle and nothing could All happen. Right, well, so, but so, that's, so that's something that uh, is just cropping up on the news. I'm, I'm looking around that the news uh, headings of an EMP is just starting to show up because uh, this rattling of the sabers has been called has been going on for a while, and it hasn't really been talking about EMP, but now it is. So do you think in and of itself, does that mean that there's a more of a chance of it happening so that they're actually starting to get more, if I can use the term very loosely, honest about what something like this could do? Yes. I'd say in a word, yes. That's frighteningly uh possible with what they're saying. Uh, I think we've covered enough of Planet X, so hopefully those that are listening whose minds are open to reason will realize that uh, Planet X has nothing to do with this. Uh, of course, Planet X has nothing to do with much of anything uh, in any immediate sense. Uh, and uh, the brown dwarf star companion that we spoke of has its own dangers uh, that are entirely out of the realm of this discussion. The uh, HARP facility, by the way, which I have spoken of as a binding mechanism, that has been what it's been primarily used for in conjunction with the creation of draught in North Korea. As I've explained, the megadeath created by that draught uh, feeds 
the entities which your military industrial complex believes are bound through the harp mechanism. Now, the Japanese know exactly why the harp was designed, which was to reverse the jet stream should war uh, commence again between Japan and the United States. So the University of Toko, Tokyo set up a harp uh, monitoring mechanism, which people can access on the net. You can go on the net and look up the monitoring uh, instruments that tell you when HARP uh, goes online. And uh, they are, of course, provided by the University of Tokyo. It's credited right there when you look it up. Now, the HARP very seldom goes online. It's a passive binding mechanism. It's passively doing its damage to North Korea. Um, it's very seldom that they ramp it up uh, to do anything that we would consider active. So uh, the point is that, um, it, and again, I need to emphasize, it does not matter whether or not you, uh, if you are a rationalist or, uh, or, or some kind of um, theologian who does not accept uh, a belief in the Klepothic entities, which I've described, all that matters is that the people who you pay your taxes to believe very fervently in this phenomena and believe that they are servicing it. So uh, whether or not they're insane and living in a deranged paradigm means nothing when they're actually killing people for it and taking all your tax dollars to build the technology by which to do so. That's true. Very true. People should really, really realize that, well, I don't believe that's true. Well, they do. And what? because of their belief, they're doing a lot of bad things. Yes, and um, so, and uh, but uh, yeah, what you say about if they're starting to loosely talk about this, and I believe you, uh, then um, then yeah, that's pretty bad. <laughs> and I was, I, I, I have looked into uh, EMP protection, and while yes, you can do it, uh, we are so inundated by computer chips yeah. that it's it's kind of impractical, right? Uh, uh, because you may protect your computer and say, hey, I, my computer lasted. Let me go online to see what's going on. Well, there is, <laughs> there is no online because all the wires are gone and all the infrastructure has been burned up. So, I mean, you know, there's, yeah, it, I, I predicted my cell phone, but now there's no cell towers. So, I mean, there is, yeah, you, can you protect certain things? Yeah, but will they work afterwards? In, in, in No, you know, you can have, what, probably what have digital that? pictures of the events. Yep. You know? That's right. What about the irony of solar, solar photovoltaic uh, technology where you require certain aspects of the grid to access the solar collected energies? And um, you've got no ability to use much of, uh, of what uh, economically and environmentally conscious people are trying to use. Uh, we really have a – we're screwed in that we are um, truly in the matrix. And uh, the matrix goes, the majority of us are going to go. Uh, and uh, the, yeah. it'll be a. <laughs> I mean, that's, I mean, I'm just saying, yeah, I didn't mean to cut you off. I'm just saying, yeah, that's the, the problem is that when you try people's, for example, a very simple scenario is people, I got, I got five years worth of food stored. I got water. I got all the stuff. I can prepare for it. Well, are you, you going to prepare by staying up 24 hours a day and being able to see 2360 degrees around you as you're inundated by thousands of starving people? Yeah. You know, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm not saying that's going to happen, but I mean, that's one of the follies of preparing for things is that you, and then here, here's a scenario. You prepare for all this stuff. You go hide in your little hideout in the middle of nowhere. No one knows you're there. You got five years of food and water and you fall on the stairs and have a concussion and die. <laughs> Yeah. You know, and I'm not saying you shouldn't prepare, but I mean, you have to realize that you can prepare, but you gotta, you have to kind of do it almost with tongue in cheek. Like I'm preparing to be the last person, I mean, I'll last longer than everybody else, or I'll be able to watch it fall apart from my uh, idea before I fall apart. I mean, you know, I, that's why I, it's good to prepare. It's good to have this stuff. I'm thinking more like for a financial collapse until things reorganize and all that. But if you really get to that big, 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 you know, pulse, whatever scenario, I mean, it's going to be pretty hard to survive that. It's more going to be luck, if you will, along with some skill that you happen to be in a pace, whatever like that. So, you know, I yeah. don't take solace in that, but at least because I am not prepared to even the level of those who are deluded that they're prepared you know, but I realize that I can do what I can and whatever. And we're all going to die eventually. So, you know, it's not that I live. It's how you live. 
for me well, personally. I, but. Right. And in the end, uh, all we can do is we have to um, try to get to know our community as well as possible and uh, try to establish ourselves in a community because it's only through a community that anyone will survive something like this. The, there's uh, the entire um, LAMO approach, last man on earth, L-A-M-O, uh, <laughs> L-A-M-O-E. Yeah. The, uh, the, the LAMO approach is, is not really the way to go for all of the reasons that uh, Mr. Yanchik has just articulated, but uh, I definitely um, have to say that uh, we can't, of course, lose sleep over this uh, because in the end, what what are you going to do if you live in a major city? Most major s- people living in a major city really can't get to know the community. Um, and most people living in ghettos like I grew up in, you don't want to know your community. <laughs> so it's the, you know, there's, there's um, all kinds of problems, but like I said, the good news is it, you really don't have a Mad Max scenario because the Mad Max scenario in itself was so, a bit of a fantasy because one really wonders how did they keep accessing the oil? Well, apparently they were uh, jury rigging uh, many ways to access it, uh, what the pumps could not access electronically. But, you know, we're not going to get to that point. Most everybody's going to die first and we'll be back to horse and buggy. Um, but I do want to use in the time remaining to us, I do want to uh, plug uh, some things. I did bring up my DVD set, and I uh, do want people to access that. Go to www.douglasdietrich.com and uh, do go over uh, to um, check out the DVD set. We've got a few left. We want to get uh, rid of them uh, before we move on to uh, some other mediums that we're uh, trying to realize, such as my books, etc. Um, some of these things, like my Roswell and the Rising Sun DVD we've discussed on this program. Uh, the DVD is still extremely important because it provides images, many, many images uh, that you would not otherwise get. We are going to try and analog that into text format. We cannot afford to do so until we get rid of the last of these DVDs. And uh, you're basically getting it for free because you're paying for one or the other, uh, two for the price of one. It's essentially 20 bucks plus $5 shipping and handling. Uh, the other DVD is, of course, Satan's Crusaders. Uh, you will have have photographs in Satan's Crusaders that you'll see that you'll never see anywhere else. Uh, These are photographs of the victims, both human and animal, of ritual satanic sacrifice that I took using a pocket camera. I learned the technique of forensic photography using these portable miniature spy cameras. That's what they were called in those days. We used to have film that we used to keep in the refrigerator. Uh, The cameras were Zeiss Optic made in uh, Germany, and uh, they themselves were disposable. And uh, I learned this technique from uh, criminology courses in City College of San Francisco. I had the exact same instructors who taught uh, Magus Anton Zandor LeVay, everything he knew about forensic photography, because he majored in criminology to avoid the Korean War era draft and ultimately joined the San Francisco Police Department as a forensic photographer. So these guys were very old. They were just about to retire. They taught me everything that they had taught him before they did so. And uh, I was able to use that to take some of the results of uh, truly satanic uh, practices as conducted uh, by many of the people who were affiliated. Uh, theologically with uh, Colonel Michael Aquino, the officially recognized satanic chaplain of the United States Army. And uh, Mr. Yanchik can attest to having reviewed these videos and uh, say that... Yeah, actually, you know, I, I saw both of them. Uh, I have forgotten pieces of the the the, the satanic uh, one you did. You're saying things, I'm like, I don't remember that. So either I, you know, I actually... Uh, blanked out at it like you know like i don't remember because it, it was so uh dis- horrible i'm gonna have to watch it again to to re re uh, do this to retain right. some of the things but i uh uh i remember very well the uh, side, uh, uh rising sun one and uh it was very uh very interesting uh the pictures and whatnot that went along with it I, i'm hoping actually that perhaps with some of these events that you're doing you might be able to record another one uh right. to go along with your book per se that might be oh, a yeah. good one-two punch. Uh, that would be uh, like on a screen would help. Yes. Yeah. No. No kidding. And believe me, uh, I do want to emphasize to everyone that the conditions we were under were nothing less than terrorized. Uh, the um, lady who was kind enough to allow me to film Roswell and the Rising Sun to prevent it at uh, the Sacramento branch of the Mutual UFO Network. Her name is Cynthia Siegel. She has since that time changed her name. 
for security reasons. And uh, at the time that uh, we were arranging for this, she was the hostess of a television show called The UFO Connection. People can look this up. It was on Channel 17, I believe, of Sacramento's uh, local regional television. And UFO Connection had been on for uh, many years, at least three, probably more like half a decade, to tell you the truth. And uh, so she had had a good run going. She decided she was going to interview me on the UFO Connection, and they cut her series off the air. It wasn't just like they wouldn't show the episode or allow her not to interview me. They cut her series off the air. And uh, so she knew she was dealing with something important. We were dealing with a lot of threats and uh, harassment, and uh, she got a private venue, and uh, we delivered this presentation without even a screen on the wall. wall. But But, but don't get me wrong. Uh, This is so important that this gets disseminated at least so that it you know there's no single port point that you can get rid of it because yeah. this information uh, is huge and I, I don't mean to be redundant but having done this for 10 years this information to me is the most important uh, it's stimulating unfortunately you know it's in a negative sense really but it's the most important information I've heard in alternative radio to date uh, our well, bell notwithstanding it. Yeah, no, I, I appreciate that because uh, people have to know, like, uh, when I talk to some people and they say, well, you know, talking about uh, Roswell and the reality behind it is a lot like the Kennedy assassination. There's some people who get to the point where they're so oversaturated, they cease to care and they say, well, what effect does that have on our lives? Well, to tell you the truth, unlike the Kennedy assassination, who was, it was a tragedy. And uh, the poor individual, of course, paid with his life for whatever he had done, uh, whether positive or negative. And there's arguments about very um, uh, thuggish things that he and his brother were engaged in, such as, as, as I said, the uh, coordination of the assassination of President Diem in Vietnam, which essentially dragged us into the Vietnam War. And uh, Marilyn Monroe, quite potentially, uh, they were involved in her murder. Um, it's very hard to dismiss that they were not. And uh, so in terms of many things they were involved with, he ultimately paid a terrible price. And But his impact on history, because he died at such a young age, was uh, not as much as it would have been. Uh, And uh, while he was alive, um, it's very hard for people to remember this, he was very detested. We're coming up on the anniversary of the Bay of Pigs invasion, which he did not back up the 1,300 Cuban commandos uh, trying to retake their homeland. And uh, as a result, uh, we are suffering Castro's presence to this very day. Uh, So there was a lot that he was uh, 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 resented for by the public, uh, again, the Catholic angle, all the rest of that. My father, of course, was a Catholic, so I know um, how um, persecuted Catholics can feel in the United States, believe it or not. Um, so th- there was a lot going on. But with Roswell, what I expose changes the entire paradigm. Unlike what happened with Kennedy, what you have is a sadness and a tragedy, and the paradigm uh, it doesn't really change because – the government was as corrupt before they killed Kennedy as it was after they killed Kennedy. Whereas with Roswell, I'm exposing something that basically destroys the paradigm that people have been raised in. And that brings us to the plumber analogy, which I actually stole from Mr. Yanchik. You know, somebody says, hey, I've got a bathroom full of crap. And the plumber comes in and identifies, yeah, that's because uh, the last tenant in your apartment filled up your toilet with cement. And, you know, people come up and they say, hey, I've got a paradigmatic worldview that's full of crap. And I come up and I say, yeah, Uncle Sam put all this cement inside of your toilet and now you're smelling the results. And uh, then a lot of people respond when I'm pushing my DVD set so we can afford to move on to the book, etc. Uh, oh, you want money for this? Well, you know, well, you'd have to pay the plumber for what he just told you about. It's bad news because what the plumber told you about the cement is you're going to have to strip the entire house for its interior plumbing and basically rebuild it. That's pretty much what you'll have to do with your paradigm. So that's what I'm presenting with Roswell and the Rising Sun. We will also uh, be presenting aspects of Satan's Crusaders, of course, at the next Super Soldier Summit. That will be in the middle of next month. It will be May 17th, 18th, and 19th, I believe, the weekend thereof. Again, that's uh, May 17th, 18th, and 19th in Henderson, Nevada. Uh, I do hope that in this economy, uh, do look up uh, supersoldiersummit.com. It shouldn't be that far away to drive from Chicago or, any, or, or many other regions in the United States. 
Um, you might want to take a plane. Uh, it depends on how you're going to handle the uh, hotel costs, which, again, should not be that um, expensive. But um, do check out www.supersoldiersummit.com, uh, and you should be able to find it. The only other uh, um, variant on that URL might be Super Soldier Summit 2012. No, it would be 2013, obviously. <laughs> uh, I think it's just right. supersoldiersummit.com. So do check that out. Uh, but they up. can find yeah. all this stuff from douglasteacher.com and also yes. your face page, which, again— you can go to DouglasDeidrick.com, hit the Facebook button, et cetera. Actually, Facebook is probably, if people wanted to keep up with you, that's probably the best way to read uh, what you're doing, right? I would imagine, right? Yes, I, I try. God knows I've been uh, very uh, remiss in that lately, and I've got a lot of uh, friend requests to accept. I apologize profoundly to everyone who's been waiting for so long. I will get to it, uh, and I uh, you know, got a lot of messages backed up, but definitely I post whenever I can um, and certainly put up posts that I do want people to access. Uh, do take a look at what I posted up on my distant relative, Maya Yinglin, when she designed that wall. Uh, it's, it, it would be unbelievable by today's standards what she went through, and that was just in the 1980s. Uh, uh, it, it was just—it was disgusting. It, 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 it uh, evoked the absolute worst in the American public and the American elites. Uh, she was part of a contest. This was a uh, national contest was held uh, uh, that was anonymous. They allowed people who were not architects, anyone, to turn in a design for the Vietnam Memorial uh, that they wanted to accommodate uh, to honor the Vietnam veterans. Uh, they had no less than thousands of entries. Uh, hers was another anonymous entry. They chose it specifically only on terms of its merits. Uh, as soon as she won it, she beat out her architecture instructor who gave her a fail in her architecture course in resentment uh, immediately. Uh, and then when it was found out that she was an Asian Pacific Islander American, then everybody who had funded the contest, including Ross Perot, who had sunk thousands of dollars into sponsoring the contest, demanded that she be kicked out and that they give the award to a a real quote unquote American. Oh, gosh. And uh, yeah, he even went so far as to get the Secretary of the Interior, uh, James Watt, uh, who you might remember from his notoriety with uh, sabotaging the Environmental Protection Agency, he actually held back the building permits for the Vietnam Memorial Wall until they could find a quote unquote real American. And uh, so. This was the level of American response. The Vietnam veterans organizations uh, said that uh, she, she was basically one of the enemy. Uh, now, the author of The Right Stuff, uh, what was his name again? I forget his name. Um, uh, Tom Wolf uh, said that she was a communist and that she was building this on behalf of Jane Fonda. So that is the level of insanity. But this is uh, the this is the current wall we have, or one that yes, was, this this was the current Vietnam huh. Memorial Wall that we have. I mean, and, how is how can you say that it's a wall of names? Yes, and uh, and they they were um, they were also disgusted <laughs> with yeah they were disgusted that it was being designed and built by an Asian Pacific Islander oh, American. As God. a matter of fact, she um, you uh, know I actually I mean I must I just I just feel like I I owe apology for not even knowing this is going on. You know, in the country. I, you know, I mean, well, I just feel embarrassed that I didn't even know any of this, and I'm here. Well, and, you, know you know why no Americans know about this? She received so many death threats that she's gone into hiding. Gosh. <laughs> that is what America is like. Yeah. And uh, so she, for instance, they made a documentary on her, an Asian Pacific Islander um, woman by the name of Mock, uh, Fiona Mock, made a documentary on her, which won the Academy Award. And because she was Asian Pacific Islander American and she used to chair the committee for Academy Awards at one point, uh, race baiters uh, rumor mongered that this was a ethnic uh, nepotism and that two Asian Pacific Islander women had hijacked the Academy Award. And there was a whole other series of death threats and uh, letter bombs that. Uh, well, you know, I, I mean, you know, I, we are well aware of anti Semitism. We're well aware of uh, the black white uh, scenario, but. Somehow the Asian uh, uh, prejudiceness and all this stuff is just, I don't know, it's just been under the rug. I mean, it's not that I hear it and go and accept it or it becomes transparent. 
I just haven't been exposed to it. And here it has been somewhat in front of me. I mean, like, I don't necessarily watch the TV stuff and all that, but, you know, somehow, I mean, you, you would think they'd be on uh, tele uh, newspapers and they, but they're showing it ridiculous stuff. It's just accepted, I guess. So, therefore, it doesn't come out. Well, many of the Asian Pacific Islanders, we have to remember, they are indeed truly a minority. There are not that many of them in the United States, and they tend to suffer in silence. So we also forget how young she was when she designed the wall. She was literally 20 years old. And imagine being 20 years old, she was still a student. She was still an architecture student. Student, and the first thing that happens when she wins this national award is her uh, teacher by the name of uh, Richard Burr, I believe. I know his last name was B U R R, and he got a burr up his ass about losing to his student, and uh, basically takes it out on her in giving her a negative grade in resentment, uh, and it all kind of goes downhill from there. Uh, Ross Perot went into her office and demanded that the Vietnam veterans get nothing more than a parade as opposed to getting her monument. <laughs> and uh, so it, he began to organize uh, a bunch of veterans groups to lobby against her getting the award at all. Uh, if it were not for that woman who uh, was known as the Miss Manners columnist, getting together with a architectural critic uh, from the Washington Post, of all places, that defended her. Uh, the project never would have gone through at all. So, well, uh, all right, well, you know, yeah. we probably should uh, start Close to it. you know yeah. wind down on this because I, you know, but it still it still just amazes me, uh, yeah. you know, on on these on these these topics. Um, but anyway, I guess uh, when the post comes, you know, uh, <laughs> that's the great equalizer. Yeah, yeah. When you turn off all the toys. Uh, you know, and I never thought, I said this just the other day to what Gary, our co-host on the other show I do, I said, I never thought I would actually be remember and be grateful for my training in Boy Scouts Yes, that may come in handy. I mean, it literally may uh, save my life. Boy Scouts, uh, which uh, God knows what they teach nowadays uh, <laughs> as far as any kind of uh, actual uh, ways to help. But anyway... People with, the, with the amount of homosexual assaults that were taking place in the Boy Scouts, I think we got some kind of idea uh, based on uh, all the accusations of child molestation that have been coming out in recent years. Yeah, well, I, it's just, it's a crazy, it, I, you know, you, you think you can't be uh, surprised anymore, and then we have Douglas Dietrich come on the show and uh, uh, do it again. So I, I do appreciate your time. I appreciate your uh, message, you know, not... I'm not liking it, but I appreciate it because truth will uh, is the only way to solve anything, and you have to know about it before you can actually do anything about it. You have to be aware of it. I, I'm glad that you're getting out and around and on a lot of different shows. It makes you harder to get rid of, if you know what I mean. And yes. I've had many a guest who have alluded to their precarious position they're in uh, as they have government pensions and big monies and um, very public speaking and, and so forth. Whereas uh, I'd like to see you get a little bit more public, a little more out there, uh, uh, so that we can get this information. I mean, I don't know. In a way, it's, it's selfish. I want to notice stuff before you're silenced, but I also would rather not see you silenced. Uh, no, I hear you. I, I, I hear level. you. And. Um, uh, it'll be a bit easier for me in some regards to hopefully become more public uh, for both of the reasons that we want, which is to get the knowledge out there. And uh, the reason it'll be a little easier for me is because I of exactly what Mr. Yanchik articulated uh, or alluded to. I don't have a home. I don't have a car. I don't have any loved ones left alive. Uh, so I don't even have any mammalian pets for them to kill. So there is no one to come after other than myself. We've explained various reasons in the past why that would be difficult for them to do so, why they're reluctant to do so, to come after me personally. But um, Bill, be happy to articulate them again on another show. Certainly, I do want to leave people again with a plumber analogy. You would pay a plumber to empty, uh, identify the reason why all the crap is piled up in the bathroom. And essentially, that's what I'm doing here. So do try and uh, reciprocate to support me if you can by purchasing the DVDs for now. We are uh, moving into 
into offering other things in the near future. Uh, but we're trying to stabilize right now before the Super Soldier Summit. It costs money to put these uh, these conventions together, these conferences. Uh, do help us out by checking out whether or not you can afford in this economy to come down to the Super Soldier uh, Summit. Uh, we would uh, certainly be happy to have Mr. Yanchik there. He's so busy lately that that looks like it's not going to happen just out of uh, his sheer time uh, consumption. No, I, I would like to. I would like to like uh, but, you know, I'm struggling to even do these shows in the time yeah. I have because it's not it's not even that I'm, oh, I'm, I'm working literally wall to wall up to this. But when I come home, I'm like, like a vegetable, a mental vegetable yeah. after... Uh, and it's it's very hard to uh, to do it. So I'm. Uh, I'm I hear uh, you. And I'm, uh, you. I very much appreciate what you're doing now. Mr. Yanchik is putting his health on the line to do this, people. So don't forget to support him uh, as well as you can as well. I know we're all asking for support, but uh, keep in mind uh, that uh, uh, we we don't get paid to do this. <laughs> we're doing this because we're volunteers. So any support we can get is always helpful. Uh, but we do love our listenership. Uh, we love you all, and we know that you're all out there and that you're earnest, true seekers, the overwhelming majority of you. And uh, believe me, this wouldn't be possible what I'm doing right now without Mr. Yanchik and his technical acumen. Uh, and, uh, you know, do send him your thoughts and prayers as well. Um, and, uh, well, I appreciate that. And we will uh, no doubt speak again, uh, yes. uh, both uh, in a public and private uh, modes. And uh, he will, uh, I will try to get this up, at least the audio. Right. In fact, I, I have to be honest, I, I think I'm delusional if I'll get the video up tonight. But I, I, I'll try to get the audio up tonight. And in the event neither come true, it will be up next week. Right. I want to get it up before, you know, it'd be great for me to... Uh, you know, be before great. the EMP. Yeah, right. I, I go to upload it and... <laughs> pff, ah! <laughs> I'd be walking down the street going, no, I talked with a guy last week who said this. No, really? Really? But come watch this. Oh, that's right. None of that stuff works. You know, so... Uh, don't jinx us. <laughs> I already had trouble. I didn't say nothing in the beginning because uh, I went to monitor the broadcast and I didn't start the audio archive. I'm like... <gasps> The first hour was gone, but I forgot I have the, the video that has audio on it. So I was like, oh, shoo. You know, it's just I got so many buttons. To, I was like, all these plates are going, you know. Uh, so, uh, but anyway, all right, I appreciate it. And we will talk again. DouglasDietrich.com is the portal into all the other stuff. And I will salute and say uh, we will talk again. Take care. And love and light to Lucinda and yourself. And, of course, to all our listenership. All righty. Retell your timeless truths Oh, it's your one hey!